Brian Henderson, who has joined us for our workshop today, so welcome to Brian. Um, we're going to be doing something this morning that we've never done before. That's right. Uh -oh. This gentleman over here, who has his earphones on, um, Mr. Phil Dorita, he's our Director of Communications for the District of Eastern North America, and we're live streaming this morning, Bob's presentation. So um, we've never done that in Luke's Home Workshop, so thank you, Bob, for allowing us to experiment uh, with your presentation. Um, for those of you that are, that are on Twitter, at different points um, during Bob's presentation, as certain things strike you, not to be a distraction, but if you're so inclined, the hashtag is Luke Workshop. Luke Psalm workshop. And of course, when you're doing things like a live feed, um, the more you're getting out on social media, the better it is in terms of uh, generating interest and all of that good stuff. So, good. Um, we would also ask that during the presentation that no one is on the hotel's internet. Okay, so that Phil has complete access to uh, whatever is out there for him to have access to. I know there's technical terms for it, but you're not getting it from me this morning. <laughs> so. Just say robust go on. Yeah, robust. <laughs> we have a robust <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you have to do that with Sally and uh, Bingo. You know. 
to gather in community with each other today. We ask you to bless us, to bless our conversations, bless this time together. In a very special way, we ask your blessing upon Bob, our presenter, that you may continue to inspire him, his work, and his words to share with us this morning as we to our care and how we are to accompany one another. We trust in your divine goodness and know that we're always in your presence. For whom or for what shall we pray this morning? For the repose of the soul of Kathleen Mahoney. Let us pray. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. program for the will of God in their regard we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For all those who are ill, especially uh, God's blessing upon Bob Sheeler and his healing and all those nurses and doctors caring for him. We pray. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. God, you know the prayers that remain in the silence of our hearts, and together we pray the prayer that our brother Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Phil, should we wait till nine? We should wait till nine. <laughs> I could start the introduction. You can start the introduction. Do the, do the liturgical dance. to introduce uh, Dr. Bob McCarty. Uh, Bob is a pastoral ministry consultant and trainer and has been in professional ministry since 1973. He started when he was six. Uh, serving in parish, school, diocesan, and national settings. He offers retreats, workshops, and training programs in ministry skills and issues internationally. Bob serves as the project coordinator for St. Mary's Press Research Project on Disaffiliated Young Catholics. In their study, The Dynamics of Disaffiliation in Young Catholics, St. Mary's Press describes extensive research on young Catholics who have left the church. The disaffiliated provide a window into a broader cultural trends that impact the development of religious identity in a secular age. Are we listening? 
Have we experienced the challenge of proposing Catholicism in a comprehensive way of living? In this session, we will grapple with the implications for our pastoral ministry. Genuine engagement provides a ministerial paradigm and accompaniment is the lens through which we can chart out the implications for school, vocational discernment, liturgy, and pastoral ministry. And we will consider pastoral strategies that enhance affiliation and engagement with the school faith community. Bob Chu is a author of numerous works. His recent book, Faith Talk, Having Conversations with Youth That Matter, um, is his recent publication, and you will all be getting a copy of this after the Luke Song workshop. Other publications have been Thriving in Youth Ministry, Division of Catholic Youth Ministry, Fundamentals, Theory and Practice, and Be a Champion for Youth, Standing with, by, and for Young People. And he co-authored that with his wife, Maggie, whom I know many of you know. Bob is a volunteer in his parish youth ministry and catechetical program at St. Francis of Assisi Parish in Fulton, Maryland. Bob has a bachelor's degree in sociology and theology from St. Joseph's University, and an MA in religious education from LaSalle University, and a doctorate in ministry from the Graduate Theological Foundation in Indiana. Bob is an adjunct faculty member at Catholic University of America and the University of Dallas. And he has time for hobbies, which includes rock climbing, climbing Mount Everest, cycling, and the most important grandparenting. So before Bob comes up, I want to say that a couple of years ago, maybe it was three or four years ago, Bob, you came and you presented at the Brother Luke's on workshop. And it was before the study was being done on going, going, gone, and there was probably a thought in the back of a lot of people's minds in terms of doing a study. Because the conversation was about mapping the changing territory. And I remember in preparation for that Luke Psalm, having the conversation with you that as I have the privilege of going around to our secondary schools and having conversations with many of you in this room and others of your colleagues, you were clearly articulating at your ministries, at your schools, the shifts that you were beginning to see. The shifts in attitude of students in the classrooms, the kinds of questions that they were presenting on your campus ministry retreats, uh, the levels of engagement that was happening uh, in terms of the mission immersion trips that you were engaged and involved in. And you saw how students were leaning more towards one and pulling away from the other and, and how your schools were beginning to see a shift in demographics from the majority of students coming to you from your feeder parish schools to the majority of students now coming to you from public school. And all that that entails in terms of mission territory and what you do. So it's fascinating for those of us in the room who were engaged in that conversation with you a number of years ago about that shifting, changing territory to now be on this side of the Going, Going, Gone study. Um, last year at Luke's, um, uh, John Vitek, the president of St. Mary's Press, came and presented on Going, Going, Gone, um, even before the national findings came out at the gathering that was held in Baltimore. He gave us a preview of the study, again, which was fascinating. So thank you for being here now, uh, basically a year and a half later, after we had the Synod on Youth and a World Youth Day and a number of other things to be able to again assist us in refocusing and um, encouraging us in terms of our conversation of how we can best be present to the young people. So, my pleasure to introduce Bob McCarty. I always like it when people applaud before they heard anything. <laughs> you know, you're either, you're either really polite or really optimistic, and either way, I can go, I can go with that. I'm, I'm really good about that. Um, it's, it is a pleasure to be here, and I, I want to start with a, a most true story. Um, a, co a college professor 
who is the noted researcher for adolescents, adolescent development, adolescent issues. This guy was on top of his game. He had the books, he had the titles, he did the courses. And apparently he comes walking out of his house one morning to, to view his just poured concrete sidewalk and he finds a teenager uh, writing his name in the concrete. And the guy goes berserk. He calls the cops, he presses charges, and the press just can't believe that this noted researcher on adolescence is pressing charges against this kid because he was writing on the sidewalk. And the guy said, oh, I like teenagers in the abstract. I just don't like them in the concrete. <laughs> So I would maintain this. I would maintain this whole, this whole thing about going, going, going. I think this is a, um, a great time to be doing church ministry, especially if you have a tolerance for chaos. And here's the thing. And I, and I think anybody who works with adolescents, <laughs> chaos is kind of second nature to us. But I, but I want to frame it this way. My favorite translation of the Old Testament, the Genesis story in the Old Testament, the Protestant translation, and in that translation it says that God created out of the chaos that out of the chaos, God created. I've come to believe that the Spirit of God is more present in chaos than in structure, than in order, than in bureaucracy, than in hierarchy. I think the Spirit of God is present in the chaos. And so that one of the functions of pastoral leadership today is to discern what the Spirit is telling us in the chaos. And so, and I think you live in the midst of that chaos every day. I've come to believe that you should never, you should never get up and talk about adolescents if you're not working directly with them. I believe that. I think our kids are reinventing themselves every three years. Sometimes it, it's subtle, and, you, and, and if you're not working with them, you'll miss the changes. But I just believe that the changes are happening that quickly, that only those folks who are working with our young people all the time, which is why I've been a parish volunteer for well over 30 years, working with my confirmation kids. I just think you got to be in touch with them to know what's going on in the midst of their chaos. And in the midst of all that, uh, that's what St. Mary's Press was about. Uh, here's what we've been trying to do with our, with our study. Uh, we wanted to look at the chaos. Nobody was looking specifically at Catholic young people. People have been doing research. I'm sure you're familiar with all the research about the nuns, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on part of that. But, but we weren't looking at Catholic kids directly. And so that was really an important concept. So St. Mary's Press Board, back in 2015, 2014, approved quite a bit of funding. Our research is really expensive. And St. Mary's Press really invested in this research around Catholic young people and what it means, and continues to do so because I think this is only the first stage of a multi-stage research project. I, I really believe that. And so they wanted to have this conversation about going, going, gone. And, and the key here was to encourage the whole church to have this open, honest, and candid conversation. That was the goal here, that it would be a, a, a multi-level conversation about what's going on. It couldn't just be pastoral leaders work with young people. It certainly couldn't just be, couldn't be bishops, couldn't be uh, clerical leaders. It, the whole church had to engage in this conversation. And so that's what we, I've been doing for the last two years, is kind of managing this project and looking ahead for the next two years about what we want to do. And so this morning, um, I want to thank you first for, for listening because I'm just going to be thinking out loud. Uh, there's, I haven't talked about this stuff yet, this, this idea of now what. And so I want to experiment with you, I hope you don't mind, and, and you across the country, that's a little bit daunting. But here we are. And so what's the now what going to include? And, and I want to be able to say this at the beginning. Um, I don't pretend to be right about this. Now, that's a nice disclaimer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So thank you for listening. But I do want to say, based on my pastoral experience, I think there are some things we need to consider, and I'd, and I'd be very interested in how this re resonates with your lived experiences of your young people. And so, because my undergrad training was Jesuit, I have to have everything in threes. I can't help myself. <laughs> and so I have three objectives for the day. For some of you for whom going, going, gone might be new information, I, I want to do just a snapshot of what I think are the four or five key findings from going, going, gone that will highlight what we'll do next. So I think that's really an important piece. I do want to use this, this image of engagement and accompaniment as kind of the lenses through which I think we can begin to look at our pastoral ministry with the young church. And then the third, I do want to identify some really specific, practical pastoral implications as, as we begin to move forward in this, uh, this work of ours with our young people. 
And so, but I, I want to begin this way, and I want to begin by making it personal for you. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do for a moment. I'm going to invite you to call to mind uh, a youth or a young adult who's walked away from church. Uh, you know, give some thought. Just let your just let your, your mind kind of scroll over your landscape of, of young people and young adults with whom uh, you've, you've traveled, you've journeyed, maybe from your own families. So can you call to mind a young adult who has walked away? Just bring them to mind. And I think it's a nice way to pray for them, is to call people to mind. So, so get that person in your head for a moment. Uh, consider for a moment, do you have any clue about what were the circumstances that may have led to disaffiliation for that young person? And the only criteria I have for you is you have to know them by name. It can't be a group of young people. It's got to be a specific young person. And if you can call to mind somebody like that, here's what I'd like you to do. Turn to somebody next to you and introduce that person that you're carrying in your head to the person sitting next to you. Just, just to bring them to consciousness and just to change this so that it's not research. It's your stories. All right? So 30 seconds, if you don't mind. Just turn to the person next to you. Who are you thinking about? Who's the youth or the young adult you know who's walked away? 30 seconds. <laughs> so guilty. And I looked at her and she goes, I feel so guilty that uh, I can't pass on my own kids the faith that's so important to me. And this other woman across the room said, and I'm angry. I'm like, whoa, whoa bloody, let the games begin. <laughs> she, said, uh, she said, I'm angry that the church I'm serving is not serving my own kids. Mm. Now, I was so struck by that. And one of the things that it highlights to me is that this is a hot issue for everyone. I, people are so concerned about their kids walking away from church, the very church that we're serving. Now, here's my other guess about how many of you picked somebody from your schools? Some of you have taught. How many picked yourselves? Just kidding. That's no. <laughs> <laughs> One time, I, I tried that and hands started closing. <laughs> but here's my guess. I'm going to guess that the people you're carrying around in your head, which I think that's kind of a funny phrase, but the one you're carrying around in your head, my guess is that they're good people. I'm going to bet that you, the kids you're calling to mind are, are kids of quality, of integrity, character, virtue. They're good people, yet somehow they walked away uh, from this church that's so important to us. So here's the first implication of this. If we take seriously our theology of church, if we believe that we are the mystical body of Christ, not the building and not the walls, then that means that when we stay in relationship, with the disaffiliated, they are in relationship with the church. Do you hear that? Yeah. We stay in relationship with them. <clears throat> they are in relationship with the church. And I think that's a, a very important consideration for us, that it, it highlights the need, and, and we know this from, from the mission, 
we know this, that, that the heart of this work of ours is, is its relationships. So to stay in relationship is to keep them in touch with the church. And so, so that's what I want to be able to build on here. And here's what the press did. We did two kinds of research, and, and you probably know this even better than I know this. We started with a quantitative research. We, we contracted with CARA to look at, to do the surveys and do all the kind of statistical analysis that researchers do, which is not my gift. I'm not a researcher. I'm a pastoral minister. So CARA did the report, and they did the report back to St. Mary's Press, and we're reading through it, and the first reaction was, there's nothing new in here that we didn't know already. Anyone working with kids, you're going to read that report and go, of course. But we felt like something was missing. And so we did a second kind of analysis, a qualitative analysis. And that's where you actually break open the stories. You, you take the scripts of the interviews. And you have to imagine this. The research team in this day and age of technology sitting down with scissors. And we have printed copies of the, uh, of the interviews. And we're cutting out what are called units of meaning and then putting them together. So my way of understanding this is when we did the quantitative analysis, we identified symptoms. But the qualitative analysis, in their stories, we identified causes. Very different. Very different. And, and that shift from the quantitative to the qualitative, I think, critical implications for listening to the stories of our young people. And so I'm going to begin with this story from Beatrice. One of the gifts of this research has been traveling the country and doing these uh, video interviews of young adults and their relationship to church. But, but here's kind of the caution, especially uh, well with all the videos. It's, it's the difference between listening to understand and listening to respond. I know that you've never done this, but sometimes what people do when they're in discussions what happens is you're already planning your response to what a person's saying, as opposed to really listening to what they're saying. And so I'm going to invite you to listen to Beatrice's story, but listen to understand, to try to figure out what was her experience and how does it show up in this three-minute video. And then at the end of it, I'm going to ask you just to turn somebody next to you and just say, okay, here's what caught my attention from Beatrice. Here's the one thing that stands out for me. So I, I invite you, I invite you to listen to Beatrice's story to set the stage for, uh, for this morning. I was born in San Carlos, Sonora, but I grew up in Ciudad Oregon. We were brought up Catholic. We moved here, um, and that's when we started going to the Christian church when we came to the United States. My uncle uh, became a pastor here, so my family went from being Catholic and they have slowly been converting to like moving to the Christian church. My grandma was very religious. My mom didn't really go to church all that much until we came here. Whenever we go to church, I would have to confess to the father, to this person that I didn't really know. I had to tell him all the bad things that I did as a 10-year-old, which to me was insane. What kind of sins can a 10-year-old be committing? Like lying, little things. And that will make me feel little. I would say about two years ago or so, I just, my way of thinking just kind of shifted and I just started believing on my own. I, I believe in a higher power, definitely. Uh, but I don't believe in organized religion altogether because I believe it segregates people instead of bringing them together, which it's supposed to be. There's a lot of good points in the Bible that you can refer to, but I believe that um, the real meaning of the Bible is it's the truth. It's been lost in translation. It's just misinterpreted in so many ways. I believe that gay marriage, like, how is that affecting anyone else but the people that are involved in the relationship? Like, it shouldn't matter what other people are doing. If, if it's a sin, then we all sin differently. And when they start implementing like certain beliefs and they want you to live your life in a certain way, 
and then you start making decisions that are not making you happy just because you want to fit in that little box. And I realized that that wasn't really what I wanted to do with my life. I believe that there's different paths, like if you're going up a mountain, like there's different paths to the top of the mountain, but it doesn't mean that my path is the right one. It's all leading you to the same place. It's all about bettering yourself and giving back and just being a better person in general. I think that's great. That's what people should do. The higher power lives within you and within me. Like, we're all one. Nature is part of us, and I feel like when people embrace that, um, they can see really that they don't really need religion. I go hiking a lot. Um, I like to golf a lot. Anything that takes out, like, plays outdoors, I really enjoy. When you reach this state of sand that you're not going to reach at church. When you leave church, you just, like, leave feeling dust. You learn to appreciate your, like, solitude, and I feel like that's really great. You become more connected with yourself. I feel like a lot of people now have a big problem being alone, and if you don't learn to be alone, you're always going to be lonely. I'm more um, happy with myself. Take a moment. Uh, what caught your imagination? What caught your attention? Just share that with the person next to you, and then I'll give a sample. What did you hear in Beatrice's story? Yeah, I herself a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that we talked about was that when she mentioned confession, it was how it made her feel. Organized religion, how it made her feel. 
gay marriage had nothing to do with her, so why worry? You know, how uh, in, uh, learning to be uh, alone and in touch with yourself, which is not, you know, that that part not a bad thing, but if, if self is all that's important, and religion, all that religion is, is reaching out to the other, whether the other is God or the other with you, you know, that's that's the disconnect. Kind of makes you wonder what her experience was early on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please, brother. Yeah, you see, you know, it was, to me, it was very me focused. She wants the solitude, but where, where does the solitude eventually lead? When, when, when Christ also says we come together as a community. Ah, but, but I would maintain community takes countercultural. But just yeah, hold, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. hold that thought for me. Yeah. I'll get to that, please. Uh, we, we thought that it sounded very powerfully that she, she was hurt in her past mm -hmm. and that there was pain that was involved in, in her decision making. Did you hear how she described herself uh, when she left church? Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? How when she leaves yeah. church, she feels judged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you remember how she thought about confession? <coughs> but how did she feel? Small. Little, little small. Little small. But did you catch how old she was? Ten. 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 Yes. Ten years old, and that was already your experience of that. Well, anything else? What else would kind of stood out for you and you listened to her? Please. The comment that stuck out to me which it was the fact that her, she sort of, you know, her mom made her church. Yeah. Yes. And the one I was talking to, I mean, this, this I think is one of the dynamics that we're challenged with all the time, too, is, you know, when we were younger, you know, we were being taught about church by our family and, and the school was the reinforcer. Mm -hmm. and, and now we're saddled with trying to teach kids about something where there is no reinforcement. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That that is that pattern of pa how you pass on faith totally shifted. So yeah. they are left to their own. Yeah. Although I do like she said. I think she said her grandmother. Yes. Her grandmother. Yeah. yeah. And I thought the power of grandparents. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> probably it's probably a different <laughs> workshop, but but I'm thinking a lot about that. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else? Something caught your attention, please. The um, she was almost like a spokeswoman for her generation. In the, in the fact that she really is expressing this moral relativism that carries the day to day that my system of right and wrong and your system of right and wrong doesn't have to agree, nor should it agree. And this, this idea that there are no more moral absolutes and just some things that are right and are wrong just because they are, uh, yeah. by the way that the, the world is made. So the idea that anything goes, and as long as it doesn't affect me, I shouldn't pressure you about. One of the things that, I'm sure you've experienced this in your ministry, part of why I've stayed in youth ministry for all these 45 plus years is that I think our young people, I think they're a window into the wider society. That, <clears throat> that when people start blaming young people, oh, what was going on with young people? I would say, where do you think they got all that? <laughs> you know, where do you think, you know, they didn't make this up. They didn't make up a postmodern world. They didn't make up a secular age. And so, but I think is that when you work with young people, we, I heard it described as young people are a mirror into and a barometer of what's going on in our adult world. And, and so I think that's the gift. I think the gift of working with young people is that I think we are getting a window into here's what's unfolding. Because they're not making this up, but they're absorbing it from somewhere. And so, but oftentimes young people, now these are young adults, but you know in your work with young people, they're not sophisticated enough to hide it. So, so it comes out, and I, I do think that's I think that's the gift. Here's that. Here, here's what I'm going to just change. Some of the existing research, stuff that you've probably already seen or heard somewhere else before, from the few foundation and the like. We know, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment here. But the majority leave before 21, which means our work is so critically important. So that that's really a significant move for us. Uh, quite a high percent of young adults across the United States. But the thing for us today is interesting. 56 million people in the U.S. now count themselves as unaffiliated, as the nons, no, not connected to any particular denomination. But in the Catholic world, it's 20 million, and of those 5.4, 5.4 million are between 15 and 25. Now, this is fascinating. You may have heard this somewhere else, but you know that if you put all the former Catholics together, it's the second largest denomination in the United States. Catholics is the largest. There's about 70 million of us, depending on how you count it. Um, former Catholics are second, and Southern Baptists are third. Southern Baptists are 16 million or something like that. So they're the third. Um, this is so interesting. This was just in the Washington Post to give you a sense of how the landscape is shifting. 
Are you familiar with the uh, the Wiccan religion? Have you heard of Wiccans? Yeah, Wiccan, yeah. Yeah. There are now more Wiccans in the United States than there are Presbyterians. Mm -hmm. That's 1.4 million to 1.2 million. So if you're a Presbyterian, you're a generation away from not existing in the United States. And I thought, wow, what a shifting territory. And so, and well, and then you know, you know, the challenge is going to be when the territory shifts like this, are we are we willing to alter our map so we can read the territory accurately? That that'll be the challenge for us. So it's, it's a very interesting time. But, but th and this is a theological thing, and I don't have an answer for this, but I've, I've decided that if I put it in PowerPoint, it, it'll make it true. I've decided <laughs> that the term former Catholic is an oxymoron. If we take our theology of baptism seriously, you, we are the only institution you can't quit. You can only be thrown out of. And so... We have, we, we talk about this indelible mark on the soul. So once you're baptized, you're Catholic. It doesn't matter. You can rip up your your baptismal certificate, send it to the Vatican, and the Vatican goes, nah, 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 nah. You're still in. You can't quit. Ha, ha, ha. You know, and there's something, well, and so one of the implications then is, I think we need some new language. I think we need some new language because we keep defining a large group of, of the Catholic world um, in negative terms. Former Catholic, non-practicing Catholic. Fallen away, Catholic. There's got to be something else here. And I don't, you know, I don't know what the language is. I just know that one of the challenges in here is as we need a language to help us talk about a sizable part of the Catholic world here uh, that we oftentimes write off by using negative terminology about them. So I don't know what to do with that. I just maybe we have to be like Beatrice and we have to convert from Catholicism to Christian. Ah, just kidding. I mean, <laughs> that always catches me that one comment. But there we are. There we are. Okay, so. Uh, I want to show you this just because the numbers are less important than the time frame. Look at this. Uh, from 2007-2014, about 36 million to 55 million roughly non-affiliated. The numbers aren't nearly as important as how quickly, how quickly that research would say that's phenomenal. Researchers would say that that's a tsunami effect going on in organized religion today. That, that that's what's happening. I mean, the rate of the nons is, is incredible. All right, so, so that's important. Uh, look at this one. One of the blessings of being involved in this research is that it's put us in touch with other research. This research is, is not St. Mary's Press. This comes out of, uh, out of Pew. But look at this in the year 2014. And here's the thing that's pretty interesting. 35% of the unaffiliated right here were 18 to 29 years old. All right, that, we already knew that. But look at this. 37% of the unaffiliated are between 30 and 49 years old. That's a lot of our generation. 19% are 50 to 64 year old. One of the things this is highlighting here is that this whole unaffiliated thing is not a youth issue. The unaffiliated, the rise of the unaffiliated is a church issue. It's a faith community issue. And I think that's, a, that's an important statement because if we frame this as a youth issue, then we take the mindset of how do we solve our young people? And that's the wrong question. The question is, how does a faith community pass on faith in a secular age in a postmodern world? When you see the growth here. So where St. Mary's Press was looking at the nons, we met a researcher from the University of Northern Colorado, Josh Packard, just released a study called Church Refugees. He is studying the duns. He's looking at those people who were highly involved in their congregations who've now walked away. And he estimates that there's something like 30 million guns, who, people who, who were involved in their church and they got tired of the politics, they got tired of the rules and the regulations and the judgmentalism, and they walked away. And he thinks there's another 9 million almost guns sitting in the pews. And this was all before the, the recent clergy abuse crisis in the Catholic in the Catholic world. So here we are in August. I'm at my parish, and in my parish, I have a, I have a set seat in my parish. That it, it's mine. I, I pay for it. And if anybody's sitting out, I make a move. You know, all the hospitality stuff. Get out of my seat. That's my. Anyway, the end of my row is Tom, who's a retired vice president from a large corporation. And Tom's very involved in the parish. And when, in August, when that report came out, <clears throat> and in the Archdiocese of Baltimore, where I worship, uh, every parish was directed, you have to preach on this. And to Archbishop Laurie's credit, he had a letter written 
<clears throat> people had to preach. But right after Mass, Tom comes up and he says, that's it. I'm done. I am, in his words, I'm done. I am out of here. He says, I get that people are sinful, and, and people, I get all that. He said, but this, this is a failure of leadership. He says, this I can't abide in the church. I am done. Now, <clears throat> he's not done because his wife won't let him. Right, so, <laughs> Rosemary, Rosemary had other opinions about this. But to hear him say that clear, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And then maybe you just saw this. This is only a, a week old or two weeks old. Gallup just did a poll of Catholics. And I think I'm going to, uh, I, I'll get this right. It says that 37% of Catholics today are, are rethinking their membership in the church because of the abuse crisis. 22% of the weekly mass goers are rethinking their connection to the church, which is, is each of those is 10 percentage points higher than in 2002 when the abuse, the abuse crisis broke because of the Boston report. So it, there's some, this, whole, this whole idea of being almost done, so think of the implications for you. You're sitting there with your young people in your, in your schools, in your programs, in your classrooms, and think about the, the conversation these kids' parents are having. You know, and what's going on there, and how does that how does that filter down to you and to the work that we do with our young people? The almost done. Here's a way of looking at it. I, said, I found this graphic. It said they're leaving. You know, 28, 14, 16. You know, I'm leaving now. I, I will leave. All ages. They're walking away. Here's another way of looking at it. <clears throat> this whole spiritual religious question, which I still think that's a difficult. It's difficult to nail down exactly what we mean by spiritual and religious. Sometimes I fall into the personal versus communal kind of dimension, but I'll get back to that too. But when we ask these young people, this is the St. Mary's study, when we ask them about, do you consider yourself spiritual or religious? 13% um, don't know, and I, I wonder if that's a, a, a question about language, I'm not sure. Uh, neither, both. This one's interesting. 7% said they were more religious than spiritual. I didn't know how to interpret that. I, I, I'm not, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means their parents make them go to church. I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure, sure what to do with that. And 35% say more spiritual than religious. But, but what I, I want to show you, though, I, I want to put this into the, this, this study just came out in December of the U.S. Same, they were doing the same, PRI is one of the best. They were doing the same question, spiritual or religious. So, so neither and one or the other, but when you add up the numbers in the U.S., about 51% of Americans say they're religious, 47% of Americans say they're spiritual. <laughs> now, this is fascinating, because for a long time, the United States was seen as one of the most religious countries in the Western world. That in my work and, and traveling around, around the world and, and doing training like in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, and England, their numbers are so much lower than our numbers when it comes to to religious identification, to mass attendance. So we were always one of the highest. And so when I saw this last year, I thought, wow, there, there's something else going on. I mean, this is all pointing to a, a changing landscape. And then what we did at the press, um, we, we were looking at specifically young adults. That's what we were looking at, later youth, young adults, and, and their relationship to church. They had to be baptized, they had to identify as Catholic, and now they no longer do. So it, it's a small sample, and, and, but that's important. And it's, it's important to acknowledge that, that we're looking at a window into the larger church here. And so, um, and so we asked about race and ethnicity. And this is important only because there's a myth out there that the Hispanic community is going to save the church. <laughs> the myth sounds something like, because of a high percent of the Hispanic community that's Catholic, that's why our numbers always look like they're, they seem to be pretty stable in large parts of our country. Now, that's not true up here. It's not true in, in, the, in the Northeast uh, United States. But what's happening now, the research is saying that the rates of disaffiliation among the Hispanic community, the African American community, the Asian Pacific community are parallel to the Anglo community. Especially when you get to first, second, third generations, the rates of disaffiliation are very similar. So <clears throat> this tsunami uh, has no boundaries, no boundaries. And then we ask these young people in our study at what age. And, now, and this is important. It's important to quote statistics accurately. I just had a funny thought about government, but that's, that's, that's a different workshop. <clears throat> we 
asked them specifically at what age, and the question was, did you stop identifying as Catholic? Not when you stopped going to church, not when you left Catholic school. When did you stop identifying as Catholic? Now, those of you who read the study, you already know the answer. Those of you who didn't, pick an age. What do you think was the median age for these young people to stop identifying as Catholic? You know, just put that in your head for a moment. The median age is 13. <clears throat> now, this, this is significant. I, I think it has implications for how we do our ministry. But watch what happens here. 74% um, of them who walk away do so between 10 and 20 years old. All right, 74%. Now think about this. If you were in business and you knew that 74% of your clientele is leaving between 10 and 20, where would you put your resources? And yet we don't do that. I, I'm not sure what happens <laughs> in church, but it's not where our resources go, not in an effective way. All right, so but here's the other part of this that makes me really ponder this. Look at this. 5% were under 5. All right, I have a suspicion. <laughs> no kid gets up at 5. I have a 5-year-old girl, although, actually, she would. But, but that's it. But, but, I, but what it does say, I think this one and, and this one here in 5 to 9, I don't think these are kids necessarily making that decision, but I do think parents are making that decision. And so, and, I, and you know the influence of all that. But at the same time, that, what, here's what that 13 says to me. It means in our pews, we have young people sitting there on a Sunday who've already checked out. In your classrooms, you have young people sitting in your classrooms and they've already checked out of, of the church. Um, in Catholic Youth Ministry, Religious Education, Sacramental Prep. So, so last year, I, I teach confirmation. These are all high school kids. And in my parish, it's kind of a cool system. Kids can pick any year of high school they want to be confirmed. Now, most of them pick freshman year because their parents pick freshman year because, you know, I don't want to run the risk. So I'll have a dozen kids, and I'll have them for seven weeks of immediate prep. So last year, the very first class, one of the kids introduces himself as, hi, I'm Gavin the Atheist. And I was like, oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Gavin the Atheist. This year, I have James the Skeptic. He introduced, 14 years old. And he said to me really clearly from the very first night, I see no reason to be doing this. I, I say I, I see no reason for confirmation. I don't get church at all. I don't see any benefit to any of this. So why are you doing this? My mom's making me. And then at the end, and this just happened two weeks ago, we do an interview with each kid at the end. And I said, are you going to go through with confirmation? And I'm fully expecting a no. I mean, he's been pretty vocal for seven weeks. Um, I actually didn't miss it when he was like sick. <laughs> you have kids like that? <laughs> uh, shame, shame. Uh, all right. But, I said, and he says, yeah, I'm going to go through this. Why is that? My mom, because my mom wants me to. I said, well, you know, James, actually, it's, it's actually not a bad thing that when one of your motivations is because of somebody else's request. I mean, I, I get that. I said, but James, I hope you stay on the, uh, I hope you stay on, on the journey. Keep asking good, because he's a really smart kid. I said, keep asking good questions. Stay, just stay on the journey. Wait, stay on the journey. Thirteen. One of the things that strikes me about this, I want to introduce this phrase here. And it, it comes from reflecting on these numbers. We all get, we all get what it means to be unchurched. All right, so no connection to, to a denominational art. That that makes sense. I've been using this phrase ungospel. I've been thinking about our young people, I've been thinking about adults sitting in our churches who are hearing the story. They hear the good news of Jesus but they haven't experienced the good news of Jesus. This idea of being young, ungospel has really struck me. And, and it's going to be one of the pastoral challenges. I think we hang in there when we've had a genuine encounter with Jesus. And when the community of believers helps us to have that genuine encounter with Jesus. But if that doesn't happen, if the good news hasn't been experienced, if it's not real for me, no wonder they walk away. That, that's my, so, that, so what it says to me then, our, our churches, our schools, our ministry programs, I think are filled at times with the ungospel. And one, and one of the underlying challenges here is how do we foster a genuine encounter 
with Jesus. That can be that can be real. Can be real for our young people. So we ask them. We ask these young people, and this is where the the qualitative analysis came in. We sat down with their res the written responses about why did you leave, and I'm going to invite you to do this. Uh, and even if you read the, the the book, you're not going to know the answer because it's not in there. <laughs> Because this is all after the book was published. <coughs> but, but here are the nine top things that they said. These are things that showed up more often. Uh, disagree with church, certain church teachings. They don't believe in religion. Many paths. That's kind of a Beatrice thing. Mm. Change denomination. Family change. Don't believe in God. Now remember, this study is before that big report on the abuse crisis. All right? So the closest we get is this moral failures of church or leadership. Mm. Hypocrisy and misconduct. No freedom to question or doubt. Drifted away. Church not welcome. So if these are the nine, uh, try to figure out what would be in your top three. You know, given your experience of young people and young adults, just just kind of in your head, what do you think would you, what would be your top three in that list of nine? And, and I'm just curious. Now this won't affect whether you get lunch or not. But, <laughs> but just just raise your hand. All right. How many would say? The first one would be in your top three. Disagree with, don't believe in church teaching. Okay, about, about half of us. How, about number two, don't believe in religion altogether. A couple of us. Number three, change denominations or religion. Uh, four, family change. Yeah, quite a bit of us. Five, don't believe in God. All right. Uh, moral failures of church and church leadership. A lot of us. Number seven, uh, no freedom to question, doubt, or discuss openly. I'm going to come back to that one. And number eight, drifted away. And then number nine, church not welcome. Right. Now here's the thing. <laughs> They're actually already in priority order. And, oh. and, here, and this is why this is an important thing. And I, It's just a reminder to us as pastoral leaders. We, we need to be careful sometimes that we don't lay over on our youth and young adults what we think are their reasons for leaving, by the reasons for doing anything. Which is why it's, I think it's so important to, to ask them. To ask them. But now that was... All right, but here's, here's, the, here's the good news, bad news thing. Not one of those reasons has significant weight. I mean, the closest you get here is that first one about church teaching, uh, 39%. The rest are just so so mixed up here. Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, based on our interviews, the number one church teaching with which young adults have the most issues. Gay marriage. Gay marriage. marriage. Same-sex marriage, hands down, the number one issue. Number one issue that we hear from young adults. And, and here's my take on this. My take on this is that because young adults say don't see gay marriage or same-sex marriage as, a, as, a, as an issue of sexuality, they see it as an issue of social justice. I have a feeling that we've done such a good job in our social justice that, that they all know that the first principle of social justice is human dignity. Yeah. They see this as an issue of human dignity. And I'm saying that to us because I think it, it has to frame how we have these conversations with young people around tough issues. But that, that'd be the number one issue. Um, and it was interesting, even looking at way down here, about only, well, at that time, about 8%, about the moral failures of the abuse crisis. Some people are saying that, you know, the abuse crisis, that's going to drive kids out. My experience is that it actually doesn't, unless what? Unless they know somebody, or unless their parents know somebody. So, so it's really not that. It's really these other kinds of issues. But when you look at this bar graph here, I mean, it, here's, it looks like this. I mean, it, when you think about the reasons why they walk away, it's, it's really confusing. It, it's really a, a jumble here. Here's another way to look at it. Every time we do this presentation, every time we do this workshop, people say, tell me the three things we need to do, and we'll do this. Well, what if there are no three things? What if there are no silver bullets here um, when it comes to responding to the disaffiliated? What, what's that going to mean for us? And I'm going to come back in a, in a bit in the second part and say the problem here is that we don't have a technical problem. We have an, what's called an adaptive challenge. If you're familiar with the work of um, Ronald Heifetz from Harvard, if, if you're a fan of leadership, I would recommend uh, Leadership Without Easy Answers. It, it's a terrific book, terrific insight. But he says there's two kinds of problems. You have a technical problem. That's a problem that can be solved with the resources you have. He said, but then there are these adaptive problems that can only be solved with a shift in thinking. This whole issue of disaffiliation, this is an adaptive challenge. 
that can only be solved, it can only be responded to with a change of thinking. Uh, people, the first thing you want to say to us in this research is, how do we bring young people back to church? And we're saying, what if that's the wrong question? What if there is no coming back to the church as it is right now? Do you see? Now all of a sudden we have new territory here. Because the way we frame this conversation is critically important because if we're not careful, we'll solve the wrong problem. We will respond to the wrong problem. See, that's why I don't think this is a youth issue at all. And I don't and I think if we frame this in terms of recruitment, I, it just Kids smell that from a mile away, and they're out of here. This is not a recruitment issue. I'm going to propose it's an engagement accompaniment issue. It's different. It's a faith community challenge. Having said that, and this is not from the research, uh, I just made this up. But it is in PowerPoint, so therefore, <laughs> you get the quote. <laughs> Have you ever heard this? This is really fun. Being in, I love being in church work. Whenever you, whenever you quote somebody else, do you ever hear this, that, the first time you do it, you say, as Bob one time said. And the second time you do it, you go, as someone one time said. And the third time, it's, I think. So, so I would propose that there are these five, this is, the, this is how I try to understand what's going on with our young people. By understanding what their longings are, what their hungers are. Because then the question is going to become, where are they going to feed those hungers? But I think these five hungers. This first one, I, the hunger for meaning and purpose. You know what it looks like? It, it's those young people with whom you work. Uh, it's the kids who say, oh, does God have a plan for me? It, it's a vocational issue. Does God have a plan for me? Is there a work for me? What does the future hold? What will I be later? Uh, my, one of my first ministry experiences <coughs> was with uh, De La Salle Vocational, part of the St. Gabe system in Philly, working with uh, the Christian brothers. And those, these are highly damaged kids. Well, you, you know, so incarcerated kids. They had such a fear of the future that it led to destructive behaviors in the present. It was These were the kids who, um, if, if you're absolutely convinced that there's no meaning and purpose in front of me, then, then today's all about me. <coughs> Why worry about the future? Because there is no future for me. They had such, such a, they saw the adult world as a drab place. They saw it as a mean place because of their interactions with adults in their neighborhoods, maybe even in their families. I was so struck by how, how chaos scared them. It scared, you know, I, I know you know this from your kids, about the value of structure, because it, it helps our kids feel safe. Even when they push against all your rules, that's a good thing. Why? Because they know there's rules. And so this whole hunger for meaning and purpose, I just, it's my first experience of this, was with our kids from De La Salle. I just saw that. The hunger for recognition. I think our kids are hungry first to be recognized by name, because it's a sign that they exist. And I think they're hungry to be recognized as having gifts to bring to the wider community. I'll, be, I'll bet you, you've probably experienced this. If you ever ask the kid, take a piece of paper, that, you know, that's really like old technology. <laughs> take a piece of paper, Put a line down the middle, on the left side put your strengths, on the right side put your weaknesses, or do they fill out first? Weaknesses. And what, what's the longer list? Weaknesses. Our kids have been socialized into acknowledging and naming their weaknesses and not their strengths. And so I think that there's a hunger for young people to be recognized as having gifts, as having, as having something to bring to the wider community, to be recognized that I have value here. Uh, the hunger for connection, it's, it's as primal as I need to belong somewhere. I want to belong somewhere. <clears throat> and it's as personal as the search for intimacy, which I think is behind some of the sexuality issues with adolescents. But this, this hunger for intimacy, I need to be connected to someone, and I need to be connected to some ones. I, I think the gift of our schools is that sense of belonging and community. You belong here. Now, I don't know if this is your experience, but in our experience at De La Salle, we knew that the kids who were in their last four to five months of our program, who were getting ready to graduate, we knew a high percentage of those kids were going to backslide. We knew they were going to get arrested. And you know why? They were afraid of graduating. They were afraid of leaving the safety of De La Salle and going into that world that they considered <laughs> to be a draft place. And, and we, just, we, could, we, could, we knew it. We knew it was coming. 
we just knew we had, we're going to have to deal with that. The, this whole idea of being connected somewhere where I'm, I belong, where I'm welcome. The fourth, sometimes this is the least obvious, is hunger for justice. But, but my experience, I, parents know this. Par you know this. Parents know this. Kids seem to be aware when things aren't equitably distributed. Because what do they say? Not it's not fair. Yeah. Seriously. And does that mean every time they say it's not fair, it's a justice issue? I don't think so. <laughs> but but it does say that they're they're aware. And and you know from your work, um, kid. I think kids want to change the world. I, are you watching what's going on now with, with young people? And, this, and there's a, a side issue here about how they relate to institutions. But but wasn't it a 13 year old kid who started that movement just that we just saw a week or two ago about? We're walking out of school for climate change, and mm -hmm. the UN's not going to do it, we're going to do it. I mean, have you ever talked to any of those kids from Parkland, uh, Florida, after the shooting? I mean, it, it's phenomenal. There's something going on here around that, that hunger for justice. And does, and that, I mean, don't you think that, I mean, that's us. I mean, it's what we do. And then the fifth, I, I think the hunger for the holy, part of the challenge here is, is, is around language. I don't know if young people all call it a hungry for the holy. You heard Beatrice talk about her higher power. I, I maintain our theology tells us, I think the hunger for the creator is imprinted on our soul. I think it's part of our spiritual DNA. I think Augustine was right. I'm sure he's happy to hear me say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but remember his prayer? It's like, my soul is restless, Lord, till it rests in thee. I mean, and I think there's other words in there, but, but that's the cliff note version. Mm -hmm. but, that, but that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this hunger for the holy, this hunger to be, to be connected to our creator. Whatever kind of language they're using, I think there's a hunger there for, for what that means. I, I remember this from my high school days. On a retreat, the retreat leader says, whether one has known God is tested by one question. And one question only, how deeply have you loved? For God is love. First letter of John, God is love. I've held on to that for all these years. Because why? Because when I talk to young people about their search for God, oh, I don't know if I believe in that God stuff. So do you believe in love? Oh, yeah. I, and God is love. We're just using different language here. But we're talking about the same kind of reality here. You know. And so this whole idea that the holy. So, then, so what's going to happen? We, from what we figure out, the question, the ministerial question becomes, where are young people going today to have these hungers fed? All right, so in this study, we, we asked them, we asked, where, where'd you go? Now, so here's where some of these numbers come from. 35% of these young adults say they go nowhere, so that, that's the nons, and then 14% claim to be agnostic or atheist, so we have them get 49%, so that gives you that Roughly that 50% had become nothing at all. But look in the middle here. Uh, the Christian non and these would be kind of the evangelical churches, community-based churches, 29% uh, here. And then 9% join other Christian, uh, more the more traditional denominations, 13% join uh, non-Christian religions of some kind, Buddhism or Hinduism of some kind. But you know, but you know what's interesting? This, this evangelical thing, this megachurch thing, Right next to my parish in St. Francis, they built a large Grace Community Church. And the first thing it did was it scared, wait a minute, we're being live streamed, are we? I don't belong to that parish. I'm talking about St. <laughs> Athanasius. <laughs> right next to our parish, they built this large, and the first thing it did was it scared our staff. It's like, oh, Lord, look, look what's going on here. And so Maggie and I, my wife Maggie and I, we do marriage prep for our parish as well. And, and we use what's called the sponsor couple program. So we'll meet with an engaged couple for seven sessions. We have a curriculum that's really pretty powerful. But a couple years ago, Katie and Ian are getting married. And Katie says to me, because Katie's mom won't be watching this, so this is a good thing. Katie says, uh, Bob, I want to tell you, Ian and I went next door to Grace Community to see what it was all about. I said, what would you think? She goes, you want to see their sound system. You want to see their video system. They have a smoke machine. I said, yeah, well, we have, we have incense. And then she goes, oh, not. And, but she says that, and she goes, in the band, and she goes, but she goes, I have to tell you, um, 
It felt like all flash, no depth. It's, it's how she described it. Now, Katie is not a, norm, a, a regular churchgoer. I mean, this is just a normal young adult getting married, trying to figure all this out. And I thought, wow, what, a, what an interesting insight. Because what it says to me is that the hunger is still there. And sometimes, um, sometimes people are, are using sacrament uh, to, to feed their hungers when, there's, when I think there's something deeper. And, and that's why at, at the very end, I want to I propose Catholicism as a comprehensive way of living as a response to this issue of disaffiliation. But, uh, but I'll come back to that. All right, so where do they go? And then this was just, this is so interesting. Let's see what you think about this. We said, is there anything that would make you consider returning to the church? 87% say no. Now, I actually don't believe that. I, I, I believe that they believe that. I do. But, but think about this. If, if one of us had been able to interview Saul on the way to, a, uh, to Jerusalem to arrest the Christians, so, Saul, what do you think? Think you're ever going to join the way? Are you, are you kidding me? What happens? Well, think about that. You know, struck blind, voice out of the cloud, God yells at you. Yeah, I'm pretty much going to remember. Let me think about that. But what it says is that grace operates differently. You and I are in, we're, we're in the business of miracles. We're in the business of grace. I mean, that's what we do. That's what we signed up for here. I believe that grace works. I do. And so I, I'm not worried about that 87%. I'm really not worried about that number. I'm worried about the people behind the number. Which is why what? Which is why we stay in relationship with them. You know this from your own journeys, your own faith journeys. Life intervenes. Things happen. Uh, people die. Relationships end. Dreams are broken. People get disappointed. Stuff happens. And there's something about that in the midst of that kind of chaos, there's always grace. There's always something else there, which is why we stay, we stay on the journey with them. So, so, so when you see pie charts and bar graphs like I've been using, all that stuff comes out of the, uh, the quantitative kind of survey. But it's worth going back to the stories, like the Beatrices and, and like the one I want to share here in a moment about Lauren, to go to their stories in their words, I think is critical. And I want to frame it this way. I love this quote uh, from Rabbi Sachs. What does this sound like to you? A community is a place where you're known by name, where you're missed when you're gone. What does that sound like to you? Cheers. Cheers. Isn't that funny? So, so back in the fall, I was at St. John Fisher uh, College in Rochester, uh, New York. And I, I was speaking to their theology classes. And I, I said, what does that sound like to you? And they looked at me and said, here we are, cheers. They said, what is that? I said, thank you very much. And I said, don't you guys have Netflix? But I was just kidding. This whole idea, this whole idea that we would know them by name and that we would miss them when they're gone. We'd miss them. Somebody pointed out that all the big corporations, when people leave after they've worked there for a while, they do exit interviews. He said, what would ever happen if we did exit interviews in the church? What would ever happen? And, and you know, and you're, I know you're going to see this in your own diocese, but here we are, this you know, coming uh, Holy Saturday night. I bet uh, the next week, all the all the diocesan and papers are going to have stories about the people who came in to the church on Holy Saturday night. But what you're not going to see in those articles, what Kara says, is that for every one person coming in, uh, 6.5 are walking away. For every one coming in, now 0.5. I think that's a really like a short one. A short one. <laughs> but, but, this whole idea that uh, they're walking away and we don't know why. We don't know where they're going or what they're doing. We would do these interviews with young adults. I have to tell you how humbling it is. We're interviewing them, and, and you know how this works. To get a three-minute interview, you're, you're rolling the tape for an hour or longer, I mean, with them. So I'm uh, really with them for a while. And every time, they, they would thank us. Thank you for listening. And I'm thinking, ah. I want to thank you for sharing your story. But for so many of these young adults, no one's ever asked. No one's ever asked them. And, and, I'm, and I'm convinced it's part of because I'm not sure we know how to ask the questions around their experiences of God, their connection to church. Um, thank you for listening. So I'm going to invite you to listen to, uh, to Lauren's story. Um, Lauren, it's just a fascinating story. And then and, and here, here's a, like foreshadowing. Catch how she describes herself. All right, just 
That's all. Just catch how she describes stuff. It's just pretty interesting. If the universe is created by God, then pieces of God are going to be in everything on the planet. That kind of naturalism and the connection with Mother Nature is something that I have really adopted into my personal beliefs. Growing up, I would describe my involvement with the Catholic Church as intense in a positive way. I went to Catholic preschool and I went to public school up until high school when I went to a Catholic high school. We went to Mass every Sunday. Nowadays, when I go to church, I go when my whole family is going to church or when my grandparents invite me to church specifically for something. I would self-identify as a spiritual Catholic with postmodernist philosophy. My identities as spiritual and Catholic are two separate but complete identities within themselves. And the postmodernism basically means that I think that asking questions and discovering things about the universe and the world that we live in are positive. But at the end of the day, because none of us are going to know the ultimate truth of what this universe looks like, there's no point in discussing who's right and who's wrong as long as we're not hurting each other. What has been most important for me in the Catholic tradition has been definitely the social justice teachings. I find that when I get to contribute back to the world that has given me so many blessings, I feel so connected to God and to all the people around me. I was always really involved in making sure that the LGBTQIA community in my world always felt welcomed and loved by me, especially as a Catholic, so that I could present to them this image of, I'm a Christian and I love you and I don't think that there's anything wrong with you. I just want to be here and support you. To portray myself in a way that says, through my actions, I am showing you the love of Jesus and God and what I've experienced as a Catholic. I would love to see more movement to have women deacons and priests in the church. As much progress as we've made as a Catholic church, I feel that that is something that is long overdue. And that's something that I personally feel was definitely incredibly difficult when deciding to stay with the Catholic Church and being a woman. Growing up, I kind of assumed that if you were Catholic, you had to follow specific political beliefs. You had to follow specific lifestyle choices. Everybody had kind of the same attitude and belief and lifestyle. That is where I felt like I was on the outskirts of this community because if I didn't see myself fitting into whatever this looked like, then I wouldn't feel comfortable staying there and building a community because I felt like I had to hide certain parts of myself. Those certain parts of myself that I wanted to hide are parts of myself that I believe come from experiences that God gave me, that I was made exactly as God wanted me to be made. None of us believe exactly the same thing as another person. There are as many different kinds of Catholicism as there are Catholics. If we had that attitude of we're all going to experience this wonderful divinity differently and separately while coming together and sharing that with each other, then I think that that kind of space would allow for more people to feel welcome. Just take a moment. Um, what did you hear in Lauren's story? What What's struck you? Now, I'm, here's the disclaimer. Lauren's uh, mom is a parish youth minister, which I, I think is just delightful. So there we are. Imagine, I can imagine their dinner conversation. <laughs> oh, what do you think? Right, so what do you think? Let, well, let's, I'll tell you what. Let's just do this as a group for a moment. What did you hear? What, did you catch how she described herself? What did she say? Did, did you catch that? She said she was a, spir a, a spiritual Catholic with, and I didn't catch what that was, with postmodern post -modern <laughs> philosophies. I mean, when she said that the first time we did the, I, I stopped the camera. I said, I'll back up. What, what, <laughs> what is that? You know, so, and she laughed and, and just went on. But, but yeah, a spiritually Catholic with postmodern philosophies. And then she tried to describe it. What, what else caught your attention from, from Lauren? But he, please. Just even what, how she identified herself means that she had taken a lot of time to think about it and that she processed it and, and it was something that was very serious to her as well. Oh, yeah, that, that's really true. I mean, she really had to think about this for a while. She's so articulate. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow. I think she's like, 
junior in college at, at this, in this interview. Please. I think there's an expectation for a growth of the role of women in the church, definitely, that moves her. Yeah, and you could, you could hear that in her. Please. She identified her love of God and love of Jesus through her actions and through how she treated other people. Which all flowed from what? Where, where does that come from? You know, because you heard her say the most, one of the most important parts about being Catholic for her. Social justice. Social justice teaching. I'll tell you, over and over again, you're going to hear it in, in Rachel's story as well, mm -hmm. over and over again, uh, these kids are coming back. They're coming mm -hmm. back to social mm -hmm. justice, which, which I, I still think says, it's, it's, like <coughs> a, it's like a huge compliment to our schools and to, what, and to our, our youth ministry program. So what kids, they're, they're, they're picking that up. They're picking, what, all right. what, what else did up? What else caught your attention? You, you listen to Lauren's story. Brian? She said the, the thing about there is no point, if, she said something just prior to this, but she concluded by saying there's no point in determining who's right or who's wrong as long as we are not hurting each other. But that that kind of struck me. Yeah. So I kept coming back to she's 20. Yeah. You know that. I hope she stays on the journey. Yeah. You know, one of my feelings was, I think I'm going to adopt her. Yeah, you know, it's just, I just, what a, what a, what a, no, I'm not going to let What a great, great story. Anything else that caught your attention? She's just, just clear, please. It almost seemed like, in her mind, she couldn't both be Catholic and love gay people. That there was a, a that she got a message. She got that message somewhere. Yeah. But did you hear, hear how she set that up? that she thought to be Catholic was to fit in this box, mm -hmm. that there are certain political, she used the yeah. word political mm -hmm. beliefs. Okay. You know, think about how many of our parishes that may sound like, all right? So there, I, think they, I think a lot of these young people are trying to transcend those kinds of labels and those kinds of uh, definitions of what it means to be Catholic. And so they're thinking differently. All right, well, let me, let me just do this then. Um, given given the, the snapshot of the data, and given the, um, and given the, just those two interviews that you saw, at your table, just how does ha, how does any of this so far <coughs> resonate with your experiences? I mean, what what are you thinking? What are you hearing? Uh, what questions are being raised for you? Go back to this idea of chaos. What might the spirit be telling us in the chaos? So I'm going to invite you, if you would, to, to have a five minute conversation about all right, what are you hearing? How's it fit for, for your experiences of young people today in the church? Um, what do you think all this means for us? And then I'm going to use that to build the second part of the presentation around, all right, so now what? What does a response begin to look like here, okay? So can we take, just take five minutes at your table. What do you hear? How's it fit in with what you're doing? <laughs>
something that's going to make people come back to the church. I don't even think that's it. Yeah, I think the issue is just the way the church is, the structure of the church. I don't think society is helping either, though. Um, the church always you know, has problems. It's a divine institution run by flawed human beings, but uh, I just think by the time the kids get to us in high school, they have so many messages that have already been imprinted in their heads from the media, from disability, from everyone. That um, they're seeing this as silly. They're seeing the, the whole belief in the divine and moral absolutes and everybody is just something they don't agree with. It's so different than anything else. I don't know what we, we have a large population of us, not what really it is, but it's amazing the goal of the to try to determine what religion they think of. I don't even know what religion what is that? We have kids who claim to be in that jail, but they can't identify the church that they actually belong to. Nobody questions the church as a person. I'd say 10% of the plot, but it's maybe they go to church on a weekend. I know the connection is more than that church. They can identify Jesus so much as he's the leader of the spiritual savior. And there's no new relationship to the real. That's a big foundation. Indeed. I think of the example. You can live your life and Jesus talks to the adult woman, the woman who's come from. Even though the Eucharist is there. Yes. They have no experience in the Eucharist or anything. I think it provides an opportunity for us you know, to be in the church, but also to, to provide experiences of our own faith to our conversations. And I don't know, like, we were just talking about this in our school. For better or worse, but, you know, it's like the sound of to share our little here about Jesus. Uh, we push the Italian so much, which is great. I don't know if you guys are going to find that or not. That's a good point. Actually, one of the conferences the last couple of years ago, she was being a new Catholic presentation. I said to remind us, this is why we do this. This is the gospel. And it's being something you know. And, you know, the funny thing is, I was teaching a lot of the very first people, I think, in the United States, I was like, my mom's out. So I was teaching the kids that are here right now. Watching this, you know, you know, you know, you know, for the first time, it was the experience of the living that was sound in the life of the myself. So I was talking about this. You know, the same thing about you. What did we learn from this first year? Many of us were just angry. We were the loving presence of John Baptist to the South. I had to go with it. I thought something was wrong. I thought something was wrong. I thought something was wrong. We were the loving presence of God. We were the loving presence of God. So John Baptist to the South. And I remember telling my friends, because I went to get someone to need prayer. I said, yeah, I'm going to have someone so do I pick a passage and just put it on my gospel passage. Well, no, I believe that. And yeah, is that is that relationship? I mean, <laughs> the foundation of that. No, I was just we can create a relationship for the sense of church. That's about the foundation. Where are we on? And we call it up. Whenever they come give you a hard day, they have to call them a relationship. They have to pay that money. Like, we earned something from them. You know, we earned like 20 bucks from them. Now I got to pay back five. Some people left the church. So we found them. 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 And the man who has to die by accident. And that's like, that's so much of my What I found is that there's this child abuse in the church, and they allowed him to become a pastor. Long story short, like mission trip, and then Pastor Mark, what we've learned is that the social justice piece is a great concept. It's this interaction with people, how you act with people, which is that this is really about finding so strong relationships with the Catholic Church. And the person that lived with him, this is why she's very much here. This is what we share in our church. This is our church. We understand her relationship with God, but not the church. And we can't get her strong here. 
that's the best we can do. I, mean, I one time heard it said that uh, sometimes we ought to relax about this ministry because Jesus is in management, we're just in sales. <laughs> so, so I was, I was, okay, I, I've done what I can do, Lord, you know, the rest is up to you. Even, even, even my, my, one of my favorite quotes is uh, John the 23rd. And I don't know if you know, he suffered from insomnia of some kind, I guess mm -hmm. the weight of the church. But even he, his spiritual advisor, which I think that's a, an impressive title, spiritual advisor to the Pope. Oh, there we are. Um, <laughs> he had a prayer, and he would go to bed at night, and he would say, Lord, I'm going to bed now. The church is in your hands. So I think, well, you know, if the Pope can do that, we can do that. So, you know, okay, just you know, keep perspective here. Keep perspective, please. But, but I'll joke aside. I think to some degree, you're, you're, you bring up a really good point, right? I mean, if you look at it in that context of sales, we have a marketing problem. We have a value proposition problem. We have a branding issue. In an organization, it's not going to change. I mean, so let's, let's not care ourselves. What are we doing to help ourselves? See, and that, I want to come, that's what I, I want to do that in the second part. I, I think that there's a, I think we have to rebrand Catholicism. And I, and I want to propose it as a comprehensive way of living and what I think that might mean. And I'd love to hear our reaction to that. But, it's not, it's not but I think you're on to something. It's not the kids, the parents too. I mean, I, my, my wife uh, is very involved in the prep program. And prep is an inconvenience because it conflicts with the CYO sports schedule, which is <laughs> coming down. <laughs> so right. but, but this is the dynamic against, right? Yeah. You know, pushing a rope up a hill, yeah. right? Yeah. But for kids, you know, sports is fun. Right. As yeah. a, the issue like the kids. So, <laughs> and, that's a whole, and that's another question around, well, we'll come back to it, around methodology and anyway. I'll say this when I get to that part, um, but I believe if we become the kind of community that will walk with our youth and young adults on their journey, we become the kind of community they want to be part of. Mm -hmm. See, that, but that's different. It's, it's, it's almost like a rebranding <coughs> how we see our role as community. I think it's, it's the shift is going to be on our side of the deal. They're the territory. We're the map. We have to create the map that Yes, I, so yes, I, I agree with you. Well, what, look at this, see, see if this doesn't sound like every one of your, uh, your ministries. See if, see if you don't find yourself in this quote. I mean, seriously, think, think about the LaSalle mission here. Think about the founder. Think about what we've done in this work of ours. Josh McDowell, Protestant Youth Ministry Leader. time for us to take a break, I want to do two commercials first. And that's not commercial. The first one is, just see, so uh, these videos that, the two that I had, and I have two more for later, uh, all of them are online, and they're all available to you for free. You just download them off the research site. I did an interesting thing. You heard I, I teach at Catholic U, and that's an undergrad course. So I gave my 20 students a homework assignment. They had to watch the five videos, and then they had to write a two-page paper on which of these videos most closely reflects their spiritual journey. Well, I have to tell you how incredibly touching their papers were. Yeah. Incredibly touching. You know, it's that kind of thing like, I can't read these. You know, just, <laughs> they really, you really just can't. But it was a great use of video uh, to have them looking at their, their peers' journey. Because uh, these are all young adults. And then, but, and this part is the commercial. Um, if you haven't already signed up, um, here, one of my concerns is that people keep asking, uh, what kind of impact is this research having in the wider church, especially in church leadership? And I'll say, I feel like we're pushing a boulder up a hill. Um, but I think it's getting near the top. 
And I think it's going to take a critical mass of pastoral leaders to start having this conversation at every level of church so that the hierarchy of the church really understands what's going on here. And so by signing up at, at the press, at the research site, not only do you, you, you lend weight to this conversation, but you become part of all the, the ongoing research, the blogs, all that stuff that keeps getting posted every day, you become part of that. So I'm just going to invite you to be a part of the conversation. So uh, it's time. One of my favorite adult learning principles is that about an hour or so after you've had coffee, there we are. So let's take a break and uh, refuel and defuel. And I thought we'd come back in 15 minutes. So it's, it's like 10.30. So how about 10.45? 10.45. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's plenty of food back there. Feel free to take it and bring it to your table.
All right, so um, so the second part that it can build, if that first part was around the territory, I want to add a couple of pieces that come from other research, and then I want to say, well, what would the map start to include? So that's where I'd like to get to now and, and noon when we end. And so I, I think this whole task, <coughs> I don't know if young adults are calling it this, but I think indeed they are crafting a religious identity in, in a whole new way. I think that's what's going on here. That, that the way that we might understand or how we came to faith and identity with the faith community, I don't think is what's going on today. But I'm gonna use those five hungers to, to get us back to that point. But I, I do think that they're creating a way of looking at the world. It responds to that meaning and purpose, a sense for the holy, a sense for justice. But here are some things that are, are really interesting about this journey. I, I want to highlight this. This is from Gallup, and, it, and it's the question they've been asking for a long time, but how important is religion? Look at this, 1992, okay, almost 60%, very, very important. You look at that line, it, it's relatively consistent. So it seems like over the last 30 years, 40 years, the importance of religion has been pretty stable. All right, well, then Gallup does this. Gallup says, well, what about belief in God? So look at this. 1944, the World War II era, 96%, 92%, and 12. The last time they asked the question. All right, really not a, not a big shift here. Huh, so religion's important. Most people believe in God. What's the only thing that's going on? It's around institutional identity. It's around denominational identity. That's the thing that, that has gone up. So something is going on here. Something is, is going on in, in our, in our postmodern world. Something's happening here. And so um, here's another key shift. Now, I don't know what to do with this yet, okay? This, I just found this, so I'm, I'm trying it out with you. This idea of believing in the God of the, described in the Bible. Now, the downside is I don't know how this God in the Bible is being described, all right? So I, I don't know that. But I'm thinking here, yes, I believe in God as described in the Bible, 56%. I believe in some other God, not the God of the Bible, 23%. It's Beatrice, the higher power. I, I think one of the subtle issues here, and I don't even know how we would measure this, but how, what image of God are we presenting in our education, in our, in our ed, uh, religious education programs or classes, maybe on retreats? I don't know. There's, some, there's something going on it, that some description, and maybe this will be a, well, wait a minute, I think we have this, let me see. I was going to say, in the Catholic world, look at this in the Catholic world, 69% of Catholics believe in God is described in the Bible, 28% don't. So we're, we, we are really an odd religion. I <laughs> know <laughs> 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 this sounds like new information. But it, it is pointing towards what's the image of God that we are presenting our community. And when I say we, I, I, I mean the pastoral formators and leaders what are, what are people hearing that they don't believe in? And what, is there an image of God that's being presented to use your phrase, to, that's being branded that doesn't match their lived reality? There's something going on. I don't know, I don't know, maybe you know. Do you have any idea what this means for us? I mean, it's gotta mean something. What, what do you think? Um, so belief in other higher power, not God of Bible. So, um, so I'm not quite sure what that means, right? So, does that mean, like, not a personal relationship with God? I hope that's a rhetorical question. Yeah, all I know is that. I don't know anything more than that. I don't know. I don't know what it means. Maybe what we're talking about here is the God of the Bible is being presented as the God of rules. Don't do this. Do do this. And it's very rigid. And it's very controlling. And young people are seeing it as a way... Uh, an institution which doesn't have much credibility to begin with because of its own faults, uh, trying to tell me what to do. That seems to make sense. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's fascinating. I, I, I also think that, yeah. particularly in my ministry, I, I teach freshman religion. And so at our school, freshman is scripture study. 
And so the kids come in with a lot of, I would say, false information mm -hmm. about the Bible and about the way God reveals himself in the Bible. And I think that they kind of pick up this false information, I, I think a lot from just outside media. And, it, and it's not something that they necessarily get from their parishes. It's not something that they necessarily get from their uh, family members. It, it, it's, it's outside media that creates an image of the biblical God in their heads that has nothing to do with the real God that, that we experience. That's fascinating. It's just fascinating. I wonder sometimes if there's a disconnect between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. Yeah. Uh, we spent some time last week, you know, uh, talking about some of the rules that God gave them as they were wandering through the desert and uh, stoning someone for collecting uh, wood on the, uh, on, on the Sabbath. So I had to spend a little bit of time talking about how God was good to people in the, in the Old Testament uh, at clothing Adam and Eve when they left, uh, putting a mark on Cain so that he would not be killed, okay? And I think that they see the God of the Old Testament as a tough God. And that Jesus is totally different, all right? And I'm wondering if some of the data here connects, is a disconnect between that. I, I, although I am in favor of Leviticus, where it says if your children disobey you, you take them to the public square uh, and stone them. That's uh, right. There, there is something about that. that sometimes yeah, that, you can't, you can't even curse good. your mother and your father. Yeah, you're, that's there it. You you're done. And then the whole thing about touching pigskin, you know, it's like, oh, there goes football. You know, now what are you going to do? Yeah. So, but, but anyway, having, having said all that, I, I think your point, both your points about previous, so, so in the interviews, when I read through the scripts, several of these young adults said, I disagree with the church's literal interpretation of the Bible. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking, all right, where, where did that come from? And, and, I, and I, don't think, I don't think it's our Catholic schools at all. I do think it comes from parish programming, because I have found sometimes that in our parishes, if we don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, this sounds so critical because it is, we don't do enough time, we don't spend enough time doing catechist formation, and when, and when we're not careful about catechist formation, we wind up with what I call a catechesis of personal preference. Yeah. Yeah. And, then what you want, and, and, so, and that, that's a danger. And so when I'm reading these, some of these scripts, I'm thinking that, that's reflective, and I wonder if some of this is reflective. That, you know, I, we, we can never set aside our own personal spiritual journey and sense of God from the work we do, but what happens if our experience of God in the work is is narrow or misinformed? Uh, I don't know. I just know this scares me a little bit, and it scares me a lot, actually. Uh, and this one scares me a lot too. So, compare, and, and then so Catholics, okay, and then younger younger people, same deal. Younger people have a, a lot less um, that sense of belief. Eighty-three uh, percent, but only forty-three percent of God in the Bible. You can see, you can see the age span here. So, so our young people, more and more of our young people, it, it's not, it's not, they don't believe in their what they perceive to be the God of the Bible. I'm trying to, I'm trying to have the right language here. Because it, yeah. All right. All right. So, you put that together. Uh, Patrick Manning said this, and I, I think, this, I think he, I think he's onto something here. He said, so teachers of the faith, and we can no longer rely on that, on that pervasive Catholic culture to pass on faith that that's one of the shifts in the territory here. That's one of the things that's going on here, is that the, the way we used to pass on faith is not the way it's, it's happening today. That, that there's something else going on uh, that I think we have to be able to name. All right, so, so having said that, here's, here's an example. The, the, the traditional Catholic markers in the past 17 years, and one of the things I like about being Catholic is that like, we measure everything. I mean, I'm, I, we are just so darn funny. We have records. For everything, and so, and if you ever ever worked in a parish, I'm sure schools do this too. The parishes, you have to measure all your whatever's going on, all your, you know, and then and then what we do because we're Catholic is well we, we lie. I mean that's what we do. Who <laughs> has time to track all this stuff? So what do we do? We take last year's numbers, we add 10%. That sounds like a good number. The only number we always underestimate 
is uh, parish collections because you have to pay a tax on that to your diocese. So, so oh yeah, way down this year, way down this year, oh, way down. But and then the only one on here that I'm convinced is made up is this eight percent here around confirmation. I know that's made up. I I just know that we've had a much greater drop off in confirmation rates than eight percent. Because I've seen it in my own parish. I bet we've had a forty percent drop off in confirmation. So so I, there's no, anyway, what it says though, to, to use Patrick Manning's thing, the Catholic culture is is not what it was. These last seventeen years there's been an incredible decrease in this Catholic culture. And so then what happens then, it, this is my kid James. I see no purpose to confirmation. You know, 14 years old, that's what he's telling me. Fewer and fewer Catholics see the relevance of the sacraments. And this is important because we're Catholic. We have a sacramental economy. I mean, that, that's an essential part of how we encounter Jesus and, and how we understand God is part in our life. So, so he, he does say, it doesn't mean a spirituality is on the way out, but the markers are going to be are, are going to shift. Here's a way of looking at it. this is from Carol. My generation, baby boomer generation, quite a few of us in here, if we had received first Eucharist, 91% of us would have been confirmed. Gen X, they received first Eucharist, 79%, and for millennials, only 69%. 10% drop off in the con in confirmation from first Eucharist to confirmation. Parish DREs would, would affirm this from their experience, all right? So that's why I think that 8% number is wrong. I, I think there's something much bigger going on here. And then take it to the next step, because as Catholics, there was a time the critical marker of being Catholic was Sunday liturgy. Well, what, what does it mean when tw only 23% of Catholics go to Mass weekly? That means they go very weekly, <laughs> very weekly. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> All right, so, but when you ask them, and they're just, they're just drifting away. But this is the number that I think is fascinating, and I don't think we're paying attention to the long term implications of only 39% of Catholics being married in the church. Yes. Yeah. This last year, I went to one, two, three, I went to four different weddings last year, all obviously young, Catholic young adults. Only one of them was in a church. All, all four of them grew up Catholic and would identify as Catholic. They're, they have no no debate about that. But only one was in, in a church, and, and I think it's Cassandra comes from a, a Puerto Rican family, and her parents said, oh, you'll be married in church. And yeah, so that, that, there was really no debate there. But the other three, and I, I know all these young adults. One got married on the mountaintop, one got married on the beach, and one got married in a public ceremony yes, and in, some, in, in Cleveland. I, I don't know where we were. But we have language for this. I mean, what do we say? You know, these folks are in irregular, is that what we call it? Irregular marriages? Mm -hmm. We have line, I mean, we're Catholic, we have language for everything. But but the long-term implications of this is fascinating, 39%. You know, and, and if you say, well, why is that? It's, it's, it's not that they're against the church, but they want to be married in a place that fits more for their experience of marriage, you know? It's the experience. It's the experience. It's, it's, it's not just <laughs> destination wedding. This is something a little bit different than that, it seems to me. So, all right, so, the overarching issue here then, I, I think that we want to be looking at is this, what does it mean to be to do ministry in a secular world? What's it look like? And the and the six characteristics of secularization. Now you saw this in uh, Lauren's story and a little bit in Beatrice's the the traditionalization, you saw that. A lot of you saw the, in, the individual personal autonomy. I mean that came through clearly in those two those two interviews very much so. And just as a PS, as I'm watching all of you take pictures of me, huh? <laughs> I'd be happy to turn this into a PDF and send it to you. Oh, so you can send it out to everybody. All right, so, so this is the world in which we're, we're trying to operate here. All right, so now here's the other factor, though. The other part of this territory that's a problem is about, and I think you've read enough about this, this whole trust in institutions. Look what's going on here about the trust. And now this, this is prior to the abuse crisis for the Catholic world. But look at organized religion, which I think is an oxymoron. Anybody who's ever worked for the church? <laughs> <laughs> organized is not always the language I would use. But, but you can see the decline here. And the one that's not on here that I just read about was we used to have the highest level of trust in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And even that as an institution, uh, the level of trust in the Supreme Court has declined. 
And I think that has some powerful implications too in a country that's based on a rule of law and order. I mean, it's really kind of. But, so, so you can see what's going on then. We are one of these institutions, and we're, the closest we get here is public schools, down to 30%. Congress, down to 9%. I think that's being generous. But, all right, so, all right, so, but here's the other part of that. What about, who do we trust in terms of leadership? Mm. And, and look, and look who scores the highest here are these nonprofit organizations. And even that score on a scale of zero to ten is only at five point five. So there's this, there's this something's going on in our culture where we don't trust institutions and, and we don't trust leaders of institutions. And the ones that we do trust come out of the nonprofit world. Even business scored higher than religion. You know, it's like, all right. All right. If this, if this is this is definitely impacting how we how we as a faith community are going to pass on faith to the next generation. This has got to have an impact here. And so, so here's the shift. We alluded to this already earlier this morning. We alluded to the shift. This whole thing of, of passing on or passing down faith uh, just not happening. It's just it's not going to look like that. All right. So, so then, how are young adults today? How are they crafting? a sense of, of a religious identity, what's that start to look like for them? Somebody pointed this out to me uh, just last week about how they're, they are collecting pieces from all these traditions and they're creating their own rituals. Mm -hmm. I never thought about this. And so you may, I'm, I know you're gonna have better examples than I have, but she said to me, there's a new set of rituals around um, announcing a baby. Yeah. So, is gender, gender the real yeah. part? Yeah, okay. I've never been there. Never been, I, I have no idea what that means, but, but I'm, I'm learning. Or how you would propose, or how your kids invite somebody to a prom. I mean, well, you know, it's, it, it looks, I mean, it looks really nice, but if you step back sociologically, you think they are creating rituals. They're creating a way, and, and remember, the purpose of ritual is to help us is to do the type of thing. Um, with deeper realities, all right? It's what good ritual helps us do that. They're creating ritual. I, I would say they're creating a sense of meaning, purpose. Um, and in one sense, I think they're creating a religious identity that just looks different. So and are there other kind of rituals that you know that young adults are creating that so I can keep adding to my repertoire? Friendsgiving. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Friendsgiving. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> that, all right, that's interesting. I had students who did um, like like Friendsgiving, but um, Friends Christmas. So like two days before Christmas, a group of like 20 young people got together. They had a meal. They exchanged teacher Santa gifts. Wow. Think about think about the hunger for connection. Yes. You know, I, I need to belong somewhere. Mm -hmm. This is really Friendsgiving, Friends Christmas. The whole Sweet Sixteen thing now, uh, mm -hmm. and especially with girls when they turn 13. There's like this huge party, a hall is rented, limos are involved. Like this whole idea of turning <coughs> certain ages has become very expanded. All right, so, so when we step back and, and you look at, all right, what, what are the hungers here? This hunger for connection, recognition, meaning and purpose. If the question becomes, how are they meeting these hungers? The hungers are still there, but how are they meeting the hungers becomes part of the issue. So, oh, in fact, that, that is, the, I think it's the ministry question. We, if we want to understand what's happening in the territory, ask, let's start asking ourselves the question, where are the hungers being fed? What, what is, where are they going? Where are they going to do this? So, so think of it this way. We've established already this morning, it's a process. What happens with our youth and young adults, and it's not like, it's not like there's one thing that pushes them. It's like, it's like a chipping away. Over time, it's a process of, of this doesn't make sense to me, why am I investing in this? It's beginning at earlier and earlier ages. If, if kids are making decisions at 13, I no longer identify as Catholic, then that means somewhere around like, like Beatrice at 10, they are starting to really have some serious doubts here about what this all means before they get to that decision making. And it happens over time. And, and so here's where, I think this is a gift. I think this is where you become a gift to the church. Because you are working with young people at exactly that time frame. That, that these kids who are doing it, the kids who are in your schools who are going through this kind of a process, oh my Lord, what a gift that they're doing it in your schools with you. 
with the weaker faculty. All right, so this is what seems to be happening. And here's a way of looking at it. Um, traditional markers of the church. Okay, so this is how we would have identified affiliation, which I think is funny about financial giving. I think that's a great <laughs> concept. Mm. This, is a, this is a PS, but we're in April now. So next month, I've been invited to speak to the uh, Florida State Stewardship Conference about going, going, gone, because they're concerned about what's the long-term implications of this. Makes sense. And then in the fall, we're going to address the, uh, the National Conference of um, Diocesan Fiscal Managers. I was trying to get their initials right. People are picking up. See, that's the thing. They're, they're, the conversation is growing. People are starting to pick up on it. I mean, we really got to keep the conversation going. But look what happens in terms of understanding affiliation. So the, the, the kids start having questions. Uh, they question, uh, you heard Lauren and you heard uh, Beatrice in the interviews talk about, they question same-sex marriage and church teaching. So there's a stretching of identity. Something happens here. And then maybe maybe something else goes on in their, their parishes or in their home life or something. And they, they stretch. They're still in the boundaries. They're still there, but over time, there, there's a pushing here. I'm stretching my boundaries here. And then eventually what happens? They push that boundary so much so that either they or somebody else tells them you're not in anymore. You're not in anymore. Mm -hmm. Which it raises that question about what does Catholic identity mean today? Here's, here's a way I'll phrase it carefully. <clears throat> do we do we believe that there has to be a hundred percent cognitive assent to church teaching in order to worship together? Do we need a hundred percent cognitive assent to church teaching to worship together? The only right answer has to be no. Just we've never had it. Mm -hmm. Read the Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> All right. But yet, I think one of the subtle or not so subtle messages is. If you don't believe all this that the church teaches, you shouldn't, you're not Catholic. You shouldn't be coming to communion. And all you gotta do is hear that once, and and we're gone. Young adults are gone, their parents are gone, adults are gone. Do you, do you see? So what's the definition of Catholic? What's happening with that? What's going on with that now in our culture and how we identify as Catholic? I, I think this that's a fascinating question. And, and I think it's a question for theologians and pastoral leaders to converse about what does what is our definition today of Catholic and Catholic identity and what's that going to look like? Hmm. So, all right. Having said that, then um, I'm going to invite you to listen to Rachel and uh, and listen to listen to Rachel and how Rachel describes her her upbringing. Now, I'll give you a clue. Rachel, Rachel's dad was a high school religion teacher, um, and she what what do you see how she describes him in the in this interview? It, it's it's dark. No, it's really it's really dark. So I want you to hear what she says about her dad. So uh, Rachel, <coughs> one here. I grew up very Catholic. My family, I call them super Catholics. It's their life. My dad works for the church. I remember my dad praying with us every evening. He was a very good catechist. High school, I was like, I have to follow all the rules. I have to be like a perfect person, a good person. My perspective was very black and white, and I knew the right way, and everybody else didn't who wasn't Catholic. But then when I went to college, things started to change. The people who were in my life weren't all Catholic. I remember feeling uncomfortable because I didn't know how to relate to non-Catholics. I remember asking my roommate one time, like, I noticed that I'm only hanging out and being friends with Catholics, and you are comfortable with everyone. And she said, I just have so much love to give, and it's about loving other people. It's not about whether they're Catholic or not. You start to question everything. And questioning has been a huge part of my upbringing in my Catholic faith. Questioning was allowed as long as you came back to the conclusion that was given to you in the first place. But now I'm starting to question and realizing that my conclusions weren't always going back to what I had been given from my youth. So that was really scary for me. And during that time, I really lost my faith. I didn't even know if I believed in God anymore. Now, 
my identification is more Catholic-ish. It's part of my culture. It's how I was raised. And I'm thankful for a lot of it, like especially Catholic social teaching. There's such a wealth of beauty and information in Catholic social teaching about how we can better love one another. A huge part of my spirituality is social justice, and I have maybe more liberal leanings than the things that I find trouble with. It's like being ordained. I think women deserve to follow the call that God has placed in their life as much as anyone else. I'm not interested in a church that divides people. That's what Jesus talks about so much, is unifying people instead of changing people so that they can come to the church. Let people come to the church and then be transformed by their experience. Just take a moment at your table. What did you hear that time in Rachel's story? What did you hear? What, what kind of caught your imagination in Rachel's story? Just take a moment at your table. What did you hear? <coughs> I feel like her, I feel like she's it's in her body. She doesn't want to get she doesn't want to get out. Yeah. 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 As opposed to the other stuff where it's like it's kind of rules based, that's fine. One is going to have a good term of it's a tough one to argue. But maybe and you can debate the, 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 the definition of what that means. But again, it kind of puts a whole new reason. It kind of puts a new position. I think it's good to have a lot of discussion in a way how we run these countries. Because there is no connection. There is no way that that's actually meeting the students because if they seem to not be they should not debate. Because they see this as a rolling part of society. It's like it's almost like blood. I can tell you there's a couple of I mean, I'd rather have the teachers in general. Yeah. 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 In general. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Social teachings of the church. It's amazing to be in conversation with her. And, and in fact, uh, she and I are having dinner tomorrow. And she talked about her life in the church and ministry. And I said, Good luck with that. So that was fun. No, but you see her as an example of how our young adults are crafting a religious identity. Go back. Remember, keep the hungers in front of us for a moment. Things are happening. Um, you may or may not be familiar with what's called the dinner party about creating ritual. But it started with two young adult women who had experienced significant loss in their life, uh, didn't know where to go with their pain, and they created the thing, they started having dinner together, and over dinner and wine, they talked about their sense of loss. The two grew, and next thing you know, if, if you can go to their website, they have a website, they have chapters in 74 cities now, I think it's 74, this thing called the dinner party. And, and um, they have to be Catholic because they created a manual to go with them. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, there's a manual, and if you read the table of contents, it includes things like icebreakers, conversation starters, oh recipes, blessings, discussion topics. Doesn't that sound like ministry? Mm -hmm. Good training like people. Do? Pardon? Good training people. Good. <laughs> yes, and it, they're looking for the feed these hungers somewhere. This one is fascinating. Mm -hmm. CrossFit. Mm -hmm. One of one of the young adults I talked to said he thinks that the new cathedral for young people is the is the fitness center. And he said, think about what happens. He said, you walk in, and what do they do? They call you by name. <coughs> they help you set goals. They help you achieve your goals. They celebrate it when you achieve your goals. And as, as a youth minister said to me just a week ago, because she was traveling, she missed her CrossFit, whatever. Um, and they called and texted to find out make sure she was okay. Mm -hmm. She might be doing that in her parishes. Mm -hmm. Wow, there, there's something. And then um, um, the CrossFit in Alexandria, Virginia, right across the river from DC, first Sunday of the month, they do a thing called Faith and Fitness. And they have a 75 minute boot camp uh, which I'm assuming is like the physical part of this thing. And then they, uh, they have a non-denominational minister and they have a 75 minute conversation. And the last topic was, who is my neighbor and why does that matter? Huh. <laughs> Faith and fitness. Um, and then another person, a uh, campus minister from Marist High School last week said to me, when she travels to another city, she goes online to find, and they're called I don't know, they're called boxes, CrossFit. Did you know that? I mean, CrossFit is called a box. I don't know. She looks up where the local CrossFit box is, and she can go to that. And I'm thinking, you're looking up a CrossFit box the way that we would have looked up a parish to go it's find this. Yeah. And she goes, yeah, but I have to tell you, you go, and, you know, they encourage you, you can bring your kids, and they'll watch your kids while you're exercising. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. They're creating, all right, so, all right, so, but, but if you watch the Planet Fitness ads mm -hmm. that are out right now, mm -hmm. the two sound bites are incredible. No commitment necessary. A dollar down, ten dollars a month. No commitment necessary. And the second one is um, the, the, the non-judgment zone. Judgment-free zone. Judgment-free zone. Oh my God, I'm thinking, I think they read St. Mary's study. I mean, we should get real. That's <laughs> right. But you, you get a sense of they are forming community in other places and in other ways. And then the, the rise of interest in think. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. <laughs> uh, the rise of interest in, in meditation centers across the country. Do you see? 
they're, they're crafting an identity in a whole nother way that, that doesn't look like church to us, but I think it looks like church to them. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's, there's gonna be a challenge here about, all right, so what's it look like for your kids? I mean, think about what might be going on in your, like what are your kids doing that helps to respond to those hungers, those five hungers. Where, where are they creating community? Where are they finding a sense of meaning? Um, are they participating in, in justice and service outside of school? I mean, I think there's something going on here, and I find it actually pretty incredible, and I find it really hopeful that they're, they're on this journey. And so, so we're gonna be challenged as pastoral leaders, do they have to feed their hungers the way that we think they have to feed their hungers, or can they feed the hungers in a way that makes sense to them? And then can we be, and, and I'm not at all advocating, I am saying that we become part of that journey, and, and I wanna talk about that. So, here's what, so, here, so here I would frame it this way. I said earlier that this is an adaptive challenge, not a technical problem. So we have to shift, I think we have to shift our way of thinking. I think it's gonna, we have, I call it moving, we have to move from maintenance ministry, and I know this is so hard, because there's not one of you that has extra time. Seriously, I've listened to you. You don't have any extra time. So here's what happens, if we're not careful, we spend all of our time maintaining the programs and services we've already created. It takes energy and it takes vision to shift how we spend our time to move from maintenance to what Pope Francis calls missionary ministry or transformative ministry. That's gonna take a shift. So it's no longer gonna be enough to just do things right. We have to rethink what it means to do the right things. And what are the right things to do um, in this culture given what's going on? And so, so one of the emphasis then is, I, I see this as a role for pastoral leaders. <clears throat> pastoral leaders need to, and I'm gonna include in that group all of you, because I think the challenge is gonna be how do we create not just individuals who are willing to accompany, <clears throat> but how do we harness the gifts of the community itself so that the community becomes an accompanying community? Especially in youth ministry, we, we would always fall into this trap of thinking, I'm the youth minister, it's my job to accompany every young person. Impossible. It's not gonna happen, give it up. But as pastoral leaders, my job is to orchestrate the gifts of the community so that the community walks with our young people. <coughs> what, what, what can that look like? And so, so I think it, it's a shift. I think that's, that's the shift here. And I think engagement and, uh, and accompaniment are the lenses. And so that's, I wanna break that open first and then I wanna talk about Catholicism for a moment. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the, the National Study of Youth and Religion that was published in Soul Searching uh, by, by uh, Christian Smith. But one of the paragraphs in there and their, their findings with young people, look, look at the, uh, the verbs he's using down here. He says, our congregations are failing in engaging and educating our young people. I think it's critically important to keep those verbs in that order. I think that the first step here is around engagement, and I think engagement allows us to educate well. Uh, and I think this is a shift. I think this is different than when many of us were growing up, and I, I wanna break that open here in a second. But, but this whole idea of engagement. So Gallup, uh, Albert Winsman puts out this book, and I, I recommend this. This is a, a required book in my graduate course, because it's at Dallas in their, their pastoral ministry program. These are all professional ministers working on their masters. So this is a required text. This whole idea of how do you grow and engage church? How do you start being church instead of just doing church? It, it's a fascinating read. It's an easy read, but it's a fascinating read. And so what, what Winsman is talking about, he says that engagement is a strong emotional connection to, to the community. Uh, interpret community as parish, interpret community as school. But think about that, all right? So engagement is that strong connection. He says that, that what happens here is that, is that hunger for belonging, that engagement responds to that hunger to be part of something, to be part of something bigger. What's that like for, for our young people today? Where do they feel, where are they literally welcome? But this is where it gets subtle. Winsman says that engagement is more than involvement. Now, I would have said for a long time that the goal was to involve everyone in, in my parish in some kind of ministry. Winston says that's not enough. Right, so here's my takeaway. I read this, I'm on the youth ministry team in my parish. I asked this, we have a thing called youth ministry commission. It's, it's 15 adults who oversee youth ministry. 
in, in my parish. And I say to them, can we name any, any adults, any families who are heavily involved here at St. Francis who are, who are gone? They were involved in liturgical ministries, catechetical ministries, whatever, and they're gone. We named seven families right off the bat. I said, where'd they go? Only one family did we know who left because of a job change. That meant six involved families walked away and we don't know where they went. Involvement is not enough to hold somebody. And my, and my, as the more I think about this, it's the parents who are catechists in my parish only until their kids get out of the program. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, now that's not a bad. I don't say it's a bad thing. All right. But, but apparently it's it's about my kids, and then when they're done, and I don't. Maybe you have the equivalent experiences in schools of parents who are involved in your school, and the kids get out, and the parent, there's a certain logic <coughs> to that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in a parish setting, it's not enough to hold them. Where, where you, we as Catholics, we put a, we put all of our, our kind of our religious eggs in the parish basket. The, ba the parish is supposed to be that community that we walk with from womb to tomb. Well, what happens when I don't have that engagement? What happens when, when, when your kids graduate from your school, and if they have no connection to parish life, have they graduated from the church? And I'm, not, and I'm not just picking on schools with that comment, because <coughs> I've learned in youth ministry that if people, this is a separate issue, but if, if our youth ministry program looks just like youth group, when they graduate from that group, they graduate from the parish. So we have to rethink our vision of youth ministry. But, but it says that involvement is simply not enough. And here's part of why I think that's going on. In my generation, the process of coming to, to faith would have been believing leads to belonging. Now, I'm a Philadelphia Catholic. If you look up the definition of a cultural Catholic in the dictionary, there's a picture of a Philadelphia Catholic. Just so you know. All right, maybe also from Brooklyn. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll not that. But I, I know Philadelphia, we're in there. It would have been, I find people who believe what I believe, and that's where I want to belong. The process has been completely reversed uh, in a, in a postmodern age. The starting point is, am I welcomed here? Do I belong here? And here's what educational theorists are saying. They're saying that there's a middle ground. Belonging leads to behaving, leads to believing. I find a place where I belong. I start to behave the way those people behave. And now I want to know what they believe that causes them to behave that way. If you have a big vision, you get to the same place. The starting point is different. <laughs> And that, and that, and that. Sometimes that's a hard thing for people in pastoral leadership to get. So when people say something like, "You know what? The, the solution here is let's give them more. If they knew more about their faith, they'd want to be followers of Jesus." It's about giving them information. It's starting with the cognitive. But what if that's not the starting point anymore? What if that's not? What if the real key here is that affect of sense of belonging? What if that's the starting point? I'm not saying that the cognitive isn't important. I am saying that I think there's a shift going on here that I that I find to be pretty important. That's, that's a critical shift. And, and here's, here's the second part of that. In my generation, the highest ho uh, compliment you could pay to a homeless, your, your sermon made me think, cognitive. All right, but, but what is it today? Today is that experience of worship. Um, it's, it's, it's more than just the music. It's the welcoming atmosphere of the community. It's what happens when I walk in the door. The, it, one of the biggest differences is when I walk in the door, somebody calls me by name, that's a big deal. That hunger for recognition. Think about what happens in our school setting. And you, you, have, a, you have a priceless opportunity because you have kids in a contained environment for four years, and then your slower kids, you have them for five or six years. <laughs> but, yeah, but we love them too. And so, but you get to know their names, and you get to call them by name. No wonder they love your schools. Because you call them by name. That sense of, I, I belong here. I, I experience my sense of community here. I fit in here. So, so this whole idea of engagement then, uh, I think this is a, a critical, I call it the ministerial paradigm. This whole idea of we as church need to find a way to engage. So it starts with how do we worship? What is our worship like uh, in our parishes? And what's our worship like in our schools? Is it indeed an opportunity to encounter Jesus. Is that what's going on here? Uh, 
do we take the time to build relationships? I think it's a natural part of what happens in, in our schools, in the science schools. This whole idea of, of uh, building relationships, fostering their participation in beyond just involvement, but forming those connections. Knowing their names. A fascinating opportunity to engage our kids on a really personal level here, and especially about their relationship with Jesus and their spiritual journey. Listen to Justin, who was probably one of the more engaged young people uh, that I interviewed, and his experience of school. I've been to a Catholic school for as long as I can remember, from all the way back in preschool, all the way up through my senior year of high school. I lived out the full Catholic life. I received the sacraments, went to Mass regularly every Sunday, sometimes more. But all the time, you know, it's kind of going through the motions. It was something that was uh, very rigid and structured. My connection with the church today, I, I would say, is generally pretty strong. On a scale of 1 to 10, I, I put it at about 8. I wouldn't put myself higher just because I know there's, there's always ways I can become more involved, more connected, more ways I can deepen my faith, and those are things I'm always pursuing. My faith growing up was not my own. It was not my own experience. It was something that I think I believed to be true because I was told it was true. I loved my faith. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I had no reason to question it, no reason to, to think there was anything more to discover from it. And I, I remember this one time, it was my senior year of high school, and uh, we had a, a class confession. You know, everybody had the opportunity to go to confession. Everybody went to confession. And I was sitting there with my best friend, and I was about to go down and uh, receive the sacrament myself, and I said, you know, you ready? Let's go. And he, he said, I'm not going. And I just had this moment of, you know, what do you mean you're not going? And he said, I'm not Catholic. And it was just like, that's when it hit me. Like, it's it's something that, that we can choose for ourselves. It's something that we can believe in or we can not believe in it. As I went off to college, you know, one by one, all my friends kind of started to drop out of the faith. I was ready to go to Mass, I invited them to go with me, and they, they just said, oh, you know, we're not going. Just casually, like, it's no big deal. And, and for me, you know, that, that kind of just started, like, shattering this illusion that I had of faith. For the first time in my life, it was a choice. It was something that I had to decide on my own. Is it something that I want to believe in? Something I want to define myself by? And I think that's what really started me on the road to a deeper faith, a true Catholic faith. Growing up for me, my relationship with Christ was a, a textbook relationship. It was somebody that I believed to live 2,000 years ago. It was somebody that, you know, I, I believed to be this amazing person, this miracle worker. But that's that's all it was. It was a historical figure. To find out later, it was somebody who's very real, somebody who's alive, somebody I can have a relationship with, I can talk to, and have as a friend. You know, that's something that, that was mind-blowing. And I wish I had that earlier. Catholicism is often taught as the truth, you know, which we, we believe it is, but to shove that onto somebody who, who doesn't want to be told what the truth is can be off-putting. I think a lot of Catholics are the reason why Catholics leave the church, and that's sad, but it's that disconnect. We need to not tell them that Catholicism is what's right, but rather we need to show them, we need to show them through relationship to show them what that relationship is, to show them the, the root of that relationship, that love from Christ, and let them draw their, their own conclusions. Let them be drawn to that love and, and trust Jesus to meet them the rest of the way. What, what did you hear in Justin? What, what caught your, your imagination with Justin and his story? And that, it's a great comment, and he makes it toward the end about to live that out. When you want Justin in your class, I mean, think about that. You know, don't you want him in, to be in your class? And, but, but one of the things that's, that struck me, and I, I didn't think of this when I was doing the interviews with him, he said his faith didn't become, it was a textbook faith mm -hmm. until later. Yeah. And, I, and I, wish I, had, I wish I had caught that, because I would have asked him, what were the experiences that helped his faith move beyond the textbook. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that, that has implications for our ministry. And then the other thing he, he said, and I hadn't thought about this either, 
He says, um, I never, I didn't think about my, I didn't think about having a personal, I didn't think of Jesus as somebody who wants to be my friend, be in a relationship with me. Then I thought, geez, I wonder, I wonder if you ever heard a teacher say that. I mean, I wonder if you ever heard a teacher say, my favorite line is from uh, Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, go ahead, Bob, make this work. Mm-hmm. When, he, when Crocodile Dundee goes, it goes, yeah, me and God, we be mates. That's, what I, that's the one line, the only line I remember from the movie. <laughs> but I remember that. God, me and God, we be mates. I wonder if Justin ever heard a teacher talk about me and Jesus, we be mates. Yeah. You know, that here's what Jesus means for you know, that, that idea. And so I was wondering, like, you know, you said before, you know, you stay on the journey, stay on the journey. This is a young man who, who appears to have stayed on the journey, but you wonder, like, what are, you know, who, who were the people? Or, you know, to kind of help him continue on that journey as opposed to just drifting off to try and figure out things on, on his yeah. own. Yeah. But also at the end, he said something I thought was very telling, too, where he said, you know, it's Catholics that cause Catholics to leave the church. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, ooh. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, but it didn't for him. I mean, he was able to reconcile it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to um, the point that you talked about, you know, about do, do they ever hear, uh, I was um, had the privilege of interviewing, sitting, sitting with and having a conversation with a group of uh, students at one of our schools, one of our secondary schools, and they were talking about this particular religion teacher with such affection and um, such joy and respect of this person's, this person's relationship with them in terms of um, teaching them religion. And I said, well, what about this person makes him this way to you? And they said, because he shares his personal faith journey, he shares his personal relationship with God and with Jesus, and that he shares the tough times as much as he shares the moments of joy. So we see what he goes through, it makes it real to us. And that, I mean, that was a couple of years ago, it just really stayed with me. Let me try to read the morning together uh, in this way. Engagement and accompaniment. And what's that going to look like for us? I found this definition of of, uh, accompaniment from uh, Pope Francis. I've been looking around. Look what he says here. He says, the church will have to initiate everyone into the, he calls it an art, the art of accompaniment which teaches us to remove our sandals before the sacred ground of the other. But then he says the pace of this accompaniment must be steady and reassuring. All right, so that means we're in it for the long haul. We want to walk with our kids for the long haul. Uh, We don't want to give up on any of them. Um, Reflecting our closeness and our compassionate gaze, our compassionate gaze which also heals, liberates, and encourages growth in the Christian life. I think Francis is actually a secret Italian. <laughs> I think he is. Yeah. I don't I don't I don't judge him so when he hear that stuff, but mm-hmm. I, I just think he is naming the reality of what it means to walk with our kids the way that the founder would have told us this. So last night you, you were sharing stories about what you thought it meant to be a Lasallian and what are the characteristics of accompanying our young people through the Lasallian lens. So so I'm not gonna use this today, but, but it's worth thinking through of our stories of accom- who accompanied us, and what were those people like? What were their, c- their qualities, the characteristics, and what is it that we want to that we want to imitate in our ministry with our young people? But I, but I'll, I'll frame it this way. I just want to give you a framework for the ministry we do, given what we said about engagement and accompaniment. I I think that the goal in all of this is to enable our young people to become mature adult believers, happy, healthy, holy adults, just like us. Uh, all right, within a range. All right, but but I want us to hold on here. To I think there's a communal dimension and a personal dimension to this. The communal dimension is this whole connection to and responsible participation in the faith community. Why? Because we're Catholics. We think community is really important. Is that my pacemaker? Uh-huh. God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here we go. All right. And then, but, but the other part of this. Uh, it's this personal journey. So here, here's the image I have, and even my confirmation kids got this one. I keep saying to my confirmation kids that vertical spirituality, my relationship with God, has to impact horizontal spirituality, my relationship with my neighbor. 
And even my kids go, oh, Mr. Bob, you're making the sign of the cross. I said, that's right. I said, your earliest form of Christian prayer, making that sign of the cross. It captures the personal and communal. But look what it does to our role. We are called to be adoption agency. We signed on. I mean, you signed on to your schools. We signed on to enable our young people literally to adopt the, the, the tradition, the rituals, the values, the teachings of the Catholic community. We signed on to that. But we are also midwife. Simultaneous, we're trying to help young people give birth to their relationship with God. And sometimes that will be intention. And, and, and that's, where, that's where the chaos comes from. When, it, when, when you work with young people, that's where the tension comes from. And, and my, I'm going to bet, for those of you who are the or religious department chairs, see if you have these kind of people in your religious department. The folks who are the heavy, extreme adoption agency, they're the ones who say to you, just give me the book. Give me the book and tell me what I'm supposed to teach, and that's what I'll teach. And then you have these really strong midwives over here who say, I don't need a book. You know, I'm just going to go with the kids' questions, and whatever their questions are, that's what our class is going to be. Both of those should drive you nuts. But, but how do you put the balance here? The balance. And so Abram Maslow, the psychologist, said, he said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you see every problem as a nail. And so I always thought, good, good pastoral leaders today, we try to develop as many tools as we can. And the tools of the adoption agency and the tools of midwife are two important tools. And you have to know when to use what. You do. Uh, there's a difference from being in a classroom to being on a retreat. All right, different set of tools. Mm -hmm. But the same image and, and same goals here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying this to you, but you don't need to hear this because you know this. I am increasingly convinced that our ministry is most effective when we have our kids in smaller groups. And you know, it's like, and I, and I mean like groups of kids under five foot tall. That's what I'm thinking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I learned my confirmation class. There's quite a different, and I don't know how you do it in your classroom. There's quite a difference between having 13 kids in my class and eight kids in my class. Because once I get past eight, I think there's posturing that happens in my in confirmation and in parish. Because these kids don't know each other the way that your kids would know each other. So I'm convinced that creating small groups, and we've done this on retreats forever, um, we need, and in our parish, we need to find ways to redesign religious ed, sacramental prep, youth ministry. Um, I've come to believe this. We got to create safe spaces for kids to ask deeper and deeper questions. So in my in my confirmation class last spring, I had these dozen kids, and I have a girl who's had nothing to say for seven weeks, freshman. Last class, ten minutes ago, I say to the class, "We've covered a lot of territory. What are you thinking? What questions do you have?" This girl says, "Mr. Bob, I have a question. I think I'm going to have a heart attack." I have a question. What is it? Why does God allow suffering? I looked at her and said, are you kidding me? You wait seven weeks. You wait till there's ten minutes, and that's your question? She starts to laugh. The class starts to laugh. I said to her, do you know that that, that is like the fundamental theological question. If you can't deal with suffering, you'll never going to understand resurrection. You know, you'll never, you really. And then some of you are thinking, Bob, what did you say, right? They are asking quite deeper and deeper questions earlier and earlier. Yeah. And, and I, I think we've got to create those safe places that are non-judgmental where they get to ask those questions. And I'm not sure what that looks like. I just know, I just know it's, it's where we need to go so that they can have these open, candid, and honest conversations. I think it's a critical piece here. I think that we're going to be challenged. I think we're going to have to move catechesis beyond indoctrinization or, um, or dictation. I don't think the answer here is giving our kids more information that they don't want. I think we have to look at, we have to earlier, now, now, for those of you who have been in this work a long time, you've probably heard the phrase, you have to earn the right to be heard. If we ever want our teachings to be heard, the first step is, are we in relationship? Uh, go back to Christian Smith. We have to first engage and then educate. I'm not saying we don't educate. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that the starting point is around engagement. It's around relationships. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's to create the atmosphere so we can go deeper, quicker uh, with our young people. And one of the ways to do this, and I, I suspect you do this, I call it a catechesis of current events. I am, I am an advocate. You know, Thomas Merton was right, which 
no, sure, he's happy to hear me say that. <laughs> read with the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other. You ever heard that image? Yeah. This whole idea that, that unless faith can be related to life, it's not going to make sense to them. And so a catechesis of current events, uh, my kids, Howard County, right outside of D.C., I asked my kids, 15, 12 kids, I said, how many of you know somebody who's a dreamer, who's a DACA kid? Half my kids know a DACA kid. Yeah. All of a sudden now, all of a sudden, current events is, is pretty real, because now they have a face on it. Yeah. I, said to, I said to my kids, how many of you uh, have a friend who's gay? 100% of them. Now it's real. It's real. Uh, this, was, this was out of the blue, and I forget why I got on this. I said, can I ask you a question? I said, on a scale of 1 to 10, what's the stress level today for a typical teenager? And they yell out, 13, 15. <laughs> I said, like, whoa, where does that stress come from? I can't, this kid, this kid starts, and I thought, how? Kid says, starts in elementary school. He says, you got to go to the right elementary school so they can get into the right middle school, so you can get into the right high school, so you can get into the right college, so you can get a right job, so you can make a lot of money, and that's supposed to make us happy. This kid's like 14. I said, how's that working out for you? <laughs> Not so well. I said, oh my God. But you see, but when you do that, you see what happens, right? You, when you start connecting faith to the streets, it changes everything. It changes everything, for, I think, for, for young people. One of the people that are doing this well are nuns. Not non, but the nuns. <laughs> this is well worth Googling and finding the YouTube video. But maybe you're familiar with that because it's getting a lot more press now. Mm -hmm. uh, but these religious just communities of women, and there's no reason why Lasallians can't do this. These religious communities of women are inviting young adults, the nuns, into their home for dinner just to talk. Mm -hmm. And in fact, these women are actually now going into the workplace to see where these young adults hang out, where they work all the time. They are starting conversations of accompaniment. It's fascinating. So, so here's the quote. Uh, I, met, I met Sister Gloria. Look what she says here about, about accompaniment. It's not about pulling in vocation. It's an invitation to walk together, and I love this phrase, and allow the deepest in our hearts, values, spirits, to be gift for each other. So, I, so back in the fall, we did a symposium on the, on the west coast in San Jose, and we had Sister Gloria, and we had some of these young adults from the nuns and the nons talk about their experience. People are creating community in whole new ways. So it's going to raise the question for us then, how does the church fit into this? What's the role of LaSalle schools? And then this is where I want to close with my soapbox. I think it's about this. I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be Catholic. Go figure. You know, I'm a lifer. I'm in, I'm in for the long haul. Yeah, I, I may have a vocation, but, but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Appleby says this, and look at the nouns he uses. He says, what's happened is, he says, no previous generation has inherited so little. Content makes sense. Content is about teaching, tradition. Okay, I get that. But he uses the language of sensibility, of the faith. He's referring to Catholic imagination. Uh, Andrew Greer, in 1980, wrote the book on Catholic imagination. It was called The Catholic Imagination, clever title. And Greer was a priest from Chicago. He was probably more famous for his novels than his research. Um, he used to say that he never had an unpublished fantasy. I think that's pretty funny. So, but, but Appleby is saying, so our kids haven't got the content and the sensibility. And he says, so here's the task. The task then is how do we reintroduce, reintroduce former Catholics, uh, older Catholics, you said older Catholics, and introduce younger Catholics to Catholicism as a comprehensive way of life. I think that's the key. I think the key is to use the image of branding or marketing, packaging. I think we have to be able to articulate and verbalize clearly that Catholicism calls us to a comprehensive way of living. Christianity was a lifestyle before it was a belief system. We made the shift uh, with the Reformation. You know, up to the Reformation, Catholics were the only game in town. We didn't need catechisms. We wrote the first catechism at the Reformation. We created the first seminaries at the Reformation. It was the, that's when the split, that's when that, I think, a, a kind of a reversal in methodology started to appear. All right, so how do we return? And, and I'm going to say, how do we 
how do we shift back to orthopraxis, the correct way of living, as opposed to orthodoxy, the correct way of thinking? My image comes from the, from the Gospel of Matthew. It's the parable of the two brothers who were told by their father to go into the vineyard. Mm -hmm. You remember the parable? And I know there's numbers that go with that, and I can make them up, and you'll say, oh, yeah, he really has a scripture, but I'm Catholic, so I don't really know really those numbers. And the one says, yes, 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 I'll go, and does it. And the second one says, I'm not going, and then does. Who did the right thing? All right. This whole idea of helping our young people they understand Catholicism as a way of living. And I'm going to propose four characteristics of uh, rediscovering Catholicism. Now, I'm, I'm just making this up, so, but I do have it, and I, and I have graphics, so that it must be true. <laughs> so here, here's what I want to say about it. I want to say about Catholics. Uh, we are social. Uh, we, we emphasize the role of the community when it comes to encountering Jesus. We do. It, and and here, here's, I'm going to take 10 minutes. Here, here's my example. It's the kid in confirmation class who, and the kid in your class who said, Mr. Bob, why do I have to go to Mass on Sunday? Why can't I just pray to God on my own? Now, the problem with that question is he creates an either-or question when it's, it's a both-and. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to tell you, this was luck beat smart. <laughs> I say to him, do you ever go to the movies by yourself? Now, think about this. A 14-year-old boy in front of his peers? Of course not. Why? Because that means he's a loser. He's not going to admit that. I said, why, why do you go? Because it's more fun to go as a group. You see the same thing. You talk about it afterwards. Sometimes people see things that you know. <coughs> it's worse. It's a better experience. That's why we go to Mass on Sunday. The good news was given to the community of believers. Why? Because the good news is bigger than any one of us. And it takes all of us in community to break up in the story of Jesus. I said, why do you think there's four Gospels, not one? One Gospel can't hold the story of Jesus. I said, so... So this whole idea, we, we are communal. Our identity is connected to the community. We, we take community seriously, which means we are countercultural. In an era that emphasizes individualism, we're Catholic. We emphasize our communal identity. Communal, now, I don't know, one, one of the popes, one of the saints, it's, it's about unity, not uniformity. And we don't want to mix that up in terms of community. Here's my second characteristic. Uh, we are comprehensive. We are a religion of the head, heart, and hands. We are. Um, I, was in a, I was on one of the bishops' committees for something. And he, oh, catechesis. Oh, the one that created the framework. Oh, sorry. And so <laughs> I'm at this meeting, and the cardinal chair says, Bob, how, how is this going to play uh, in youth ministry? I have a choice to make. I can say, oh, it's not a prayer. You know, there goes my influence. Or I can say, oh, yeah, this is just delightful. That's just a plain lie. <laughs> Luck be smart. I said, well, Bishop, I'm thinking about Baltimore. Think about my setting. Um, eight or nine bishops and cardinals and stuff, and then a bunch of advisors. You know, and we're not allowed to talk unless we're, we're asked. I say, Baltimore Catechism, question number six, why did God make us? In unison, they respond. To know, love, and serve him in this world, be happy with him in the next. Know, love, and serve, head, heart, and hands. We've always been comprehensive. We just forgot. And we emphasize the head over the heart and the hands. Think about this. To know, we are a religion of Thomas Aquinas. Okay, that, that's pretty serious. Think about love. We, we are also a church of the mystics of Julian of Norwich, of John of the Cross, of Ignatius. I mean, think about that. We, I, this is a PS. I have a suspicion our mystical tradition is more attractive to young adults today uh, than our theological tradition. I think our mystics are more important than our theologians. Because why? Because mysticism is experiential knowledge. It's the experience. And to serve. We are, we are a religion of Mother Teresa, for God's sake. I mean, uh, Oscar Romero, I think the service your kids do. Do you see that? We are inherently comprehensive. Head, heart, and hands. We are Catholic. We see the world differently. We're, we're Catholic. We will bless anything. <laughs> A lot of people bless babies. Okay, that's cute. But we're Catholic. We will bless absolutely anything. Baltimore does a blessing of the fleet. 
Portland, Oregon, every year, a blessing of bicycles. Sturgis, South Dakota, the home of what? Bicycle room, a motorcycle. A motorcycle room. Harley Davidson. Yeah. Rapid City Diocese, every year, a blessing of Harley Davidson's. My parish, uh, every year we do a blessing of our kids' driver's license and car keys. Uh, and we do it in the Sunday, I have to tell you, it's so funny, darn funny. Uh, it's like right in the Sunday liturgy, they put them on the table. Okay. Father Dennis, the pastor, will come down after the homily. We make the, first off, we bless them with holy water. Cause, and do you know how you make holy water? You start with regular tap water and you boil the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so the kids, we make those kids stand and we bless them. May you drive responsibly, you know, may you make good decisions. So we, we make their parents stand. May you have patience, may you have good insurance. <laughs> 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 and three right in. I mean, we wrote that in the prayer. The people laugh, the kids laugh, the parents laugh, and every young kid sitting in that church says, when, when I get my license. You know, it's connecting faith to life. It's, it's, it's a, we'll bless anything as Catholic. We're, we're Catholic, Irish Catholic. <laughs> Only Catholics could have invented Lent. <laughs> Irish Catholics were sitting around feeling too good about themselves. That, that's what we do. If life is too good, we feel guilty about that. <laughs> and one of them said, I don't know, yeah, let's give up everything. Yeah, let's give up everything. Let's do it for 40 days. Be just like Jesus. Yeah, let's give up everything. But only Irish Catholics, not well, only Catholics could have been at Mardi Gras. Because one of them said, I have an idea. Before we do all that, let's party like there's no tomorrow. And don't you see that that's what it means to be Catholic? We are Catholics of Mardi Gras, and we are Catholics of Lent. We are, we are Catholics of Good Friday, Easter <coughs> Sunday. Uh, we're Paschal Mystery Catholics. We always hold that, always hold that together. The suffering and direction, resurrection is always held together. We're Catholic. Why? Because that's how we see the world. We see the world. We, we're Catholic. We will pray anything through the streets. Anything. I blame, I blame the Hispanic community, but now I've noticed that the Polish community does this, the Croatian community. Uh, we will pray any statue through the street. You pick a holy day, uh, we have a statue for that. And we'll, we pray it, and we have bullhorns, we put them in the back of pickup trucks, because that's what we do. Why? Because we're Catholic. It's it's all what that's what we do. Who who else saves the bones of dead people? <laughs> Catholics. You know, we call them relics. But we save the <laughs> bones of dead people. And then we pray over them and we kiss them and I don't we are so weird. Why? Because we see the world differently. I was in a conversation, I bet you've had this where I've been challenged on why doesn't the Vatican sell all their uh, art and, and feed the poor. When Jesus said the poor you'll have with you always, he was saying it. You can do all that, but you're still going to have poor. So it, it's really not a band-aid here. You need a structural change. But I've come to think that the Catholic Church is the steward of the world's beauty. Because if the Catholic Church ever sold off all that stuff, we'd never see it. Mm -hmm. It would be in private collection somewhere else. So this whole idea of being a step, why? We're Catholic. We are stewards of the world's beauty. I, I just think it's it. And then the fourth one, this is the last one. We are a church that engages the world. Um, we don't see religion as a way to, to protect us from the evil world. We see our faith as something that prepares us to transform that world. That's what we do. We're Catholic. Every day in the United States, a million hungry people eat in Catholic institutions. I think it's one out of every six hospital beds is in a Catholic hospital. You know, that that's what we do. CRS. CRS, a Catholic charities, a Caritas International, the largest non-governmental relief agency in the world. Why? Because we're Catholic. And then, um, where I was sitting at the table last night, I, I didn't know this, that almost a million kids every day are educated in a Italian institution mm -hmm. around the world. It's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Why? Because we're Catholic. That's what we do. We, we engage the world. That's what we do. We created the university system, as you know. We created the school system. Why? Because because Felix House said we, we need to we need to educate the kids on the street, not just the kids who can afford tutors. That's what we do. We're, we're Catholic. We engage the world. And so so to bring our to bring our to bring our morning to a close then. Here, here are the questions to consider for us. So here are the things that I, I think we need to attend to. It's an adaptive challenge, not a technical challenge. It takes a different way of thinking. What's it going to look like for us to have schools that are, are focused on engagement and accompaniment? What would that start to, to mean for us? How and where do we introduce Catholicism as a comprehensive way of living that fits 
And in fact, I think there's room in that for fasting, abstaining, novenas, all the rosary, adoration, justice, service. See, I want to hold all those things together because why? Because I think it's a way of ordering our life. I think it's a way of living that, that just seems to make sense to me. Can we go deeper quicker? Can we provide you safe places for our young people to ask the important questions? And, and only in that way that do we get to this. Um, we have to give some thought to what do we let go? What needs to be rethought through here? What are the implications for ministry? It, this would be a fabulous conversation for our religion department, um, religious departments, campus ministry departments, or the mission office um, to have. What are the implications for us of all of this in this school at this time with these young people? So I want to close my, my part of this with an Irish blessing since I've already picked on them once, or twice, or something here. But here's the Irish blessing for you. The Irish have a blessing and it says this. It says, if you want to be happy for an hour, take a nap. Now that may sound like a really good idea this afternoon. <laughs> if you want to be happy for a day, go fishing. If you want to be happy for a week, go on vacation. If you want to be happy for a month, get married. I did not write this. <laughs> this is the if you want to be happy for a year, get a job. But if you want to be happy forever, serve others. Amen. So may the Lord bless your ministry. May the Lord bless your ministry, your outreach to the affiliated and the disaffiliated. May you reach out to the engaged and the disengaged. May they indeed come to know that Jesus is one who wants to be in relationship with them as we emphasize Catholicism as a comprehensive way of living. May you continue to serve your young people. May you be happy forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bob. Um, certainly a very rich uh, morning filled with um, lots of provocative um, and challenging um, invitations that you have provided to us, uh, along with some you know, very uh, significant information that, that allows us to resonate with the challenges that you have asked us to look at. I think particularly we're particularly blessed to hear this message during this time of Jubilee and during the time where we're celebrating as the Salins that educate over a million students in 80 countries around the world, where no matter where you go, if you said, what is the mission of the Salians? What's the mission of the Brothers of the Christian Schools? Give a human and Christian education to the young, especially the poor. Um, it's our unifying vocational call. And in this time where we're celebrating the, the, the life and the charism and the mission of the founder, I'm reminded of just two things in particular. One from the rule of the Brothers of the Christian Schools where it says, I had to look it up because I knew it was there, but I want to get the wording right. Um, from the founder, always address people by their names and with great respect. I mean, that's part of the rule of the brothers and by extension of all of us. And then the second thing was a couple of years ago, Brother Bob Schuler, our Superior General, was addressing the LaSallian Association of Secondary School Chief Administrators and he said something in his talk that I, I immediately wrote it down, it struck with me, and he said this, the decisive innovation of the founder. So the Superior General was talking about the decisive innovation of the founder was that education happens within the context of community. So as the Salians, our decisive foundational innovation of our founder is that education happens within the context of community. So we listen to all that you have so generously shared with us this morning and place that within our spirituality as Lasallians, our heritage, our tradition, our pedagogy, our call to be present to the young people that we speak so eloquently and often about God entrusting to our care that these young people have been entrusted to our care. And again, this morning through your presentation, you have brought us to 
um, I think a deep place of consideration and understanding of what that call is for us. So thank you once again for being with us. Thank you. introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Ahern, who has joined us, um, and he'll be with us uh, now, and then our presenter for this afternoon. So, Kevin, thank you so much for driving on down south to Jersey, being here with us. Um, we have lunch. <laughs> we have lunch now, <laughs> and uh, we have our lunch break to one o'clock, and we'll start promptly in this room at one o'clock. Thank you, everybody. Have a good lunch.